Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is speaking with Jared Picard. Jared, along with his wife, Velisa, and father, Mark, is the founder of Be Here Farm Plus Nature, a family-owned regenerative farm in St. Helena, California, where they grow over 300 varieties of fruits, vegetables, herbs, and flowers on their Demeter-certified biodynamic farm. The crops are transformed by hand into world-class skincare and body care treatments without the use of chemicals, including organic ones. Jared quit his job on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange at the age of 28 to pursue a series of farming apprenticeships. Jared credits much of his transformation to discovering the four doctor teachings presented by Paul, which led him to develop his family's project, Be Here Farm Plus Nature. Hello, everybody. Have you ever wondered what biodynamic farming is and why Rudolf Steiner created it? Or what the difference between biodynamic farming and organic farming is? Did you know that biodynamic farmers are very attuned to cosmic forces, such as the influence of the moon on planting cycles, and that they harmonize the preparations of biodynamic equivalents of homeopathic medicines for the earth to these cycles for reasons that greatly increase their potency? Today you have the pleasure of meeting one of my clients and friends that never ceases to amaze me. He has shared the best popcorn, vegetables, and biodynamically grown marijuana I've ever had. Jared Picard is not only an excellent biodynamic farmer, he creates beautiful art on the land and on canvas, is a husband and a father to a beautiful daughter, and as you are about to learn, Jared hand manufactures one of the most incredible skin serums in the world. If you want to have healthy skin and slow the effects of aging, You'll definitely want to listen to how much careful, skillful work goes into the creation of such a product, including the step-by-step process from preparing the land, planting, harvesting, curing, extracting, and packaging. In fact, Jared's serum comes in glass bottles with a specially designed logo that produces BG3 energy, which is the centering energy that brings both your body back to balance and facilitates deep calm and healing and keeps the serum fresh and vital. As most of you know, I've studied soil science, commercial, organic, and biodynamic farming, and I was delighted to learn several new things from Jared about biodynamic farming that I found amazing and exciting, and I expect you will too be amazed at biodynamic farming technology and the power that it has to rapidly regenerate soils, environments, and produce the most nutritious food and natural products in the world. Grab your notebook your favorite drink. And let's begin this incredible journey into the deep beauty of biodynamic farming and what it takes to make a world-class skin serum with Jared Picard. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. And as usual, I have a very interesting guest for you. You're going to learn a hell of a lot today. In fact, even with my knowledge of organics and biodynamic farming, I was learning things from Jared today. So Jared Picard, welcome. Hey, buddy. Yeah. Jared's been a client of mine for, well, we've known each other for a long time, but he worked personally with me for a good five years or so as a consultant and coaching him and supporting him and his family. And Jared is uh, my buddy, Jason Picard's brother. And Jason's my longest running client of 10 years. And the whole Picard family is quite amazing and fun to work with and relate to. So thank you guys for being so amazing. And uh, Jared's also a biodynamic farmer. He owns a farm. He lives on 300 acres of family family owned land in partnership with his father and his wife. And as Jared told me, which I know is true, we've got one of the most unique farms there is. My experience of Jared's farm, even though I haven't been there, I was very close. We uh, Penny flew Angie to shaman school but the plane was a small plane and it took us like, what, five and a half hours to get there. And we had to stop for fuel. So if we would have gone and saw you, we would have had to fly late at night and Penny didn't want to do that. I don't know if you remember that. I do remember you coming nearby. I was five miles from you at a tiny little airport. Yeah. Well, what can we do about it now? Well, you know, I was going to say what happened was, even though I didn't get to go there, you sent me you're absolutely mind-blowingly good popcorn multiple times, which I just loved. You sent me green powders, vinegars, hot sauces, fermented foods, tinctures, which were very powerful. Really cool. I still have some of them. Well, I mean, you couldn't come, so what could we do? We had to send the farm to you. I love it. 
I love it because I'm getting lazy on the travel and my my growing ears and lots of airplane rides. But one of the, the, the real reason I wanted to bring you on the podcast is because how long ago did you start making your summer solstice face serum? It's something that we've been experimenting with for several <laughs> years. In terms of selling it, we've been selling it just to a local private uh, membership club that we developed for the farm right. and at local farmer's markets. Mm. But just about two and a half months ago, we launched it for the first time in a more formal way on a website called sunpotion.com. And I don't know if you're familiar with Sun Potion at all. Mm-mm. They're out of Santa Barbara, and they're um, they're most well known for incredible sourcing of beyond organic and wild crafted ingredients from around the world. Mm. And they focus on adaptogenic and herbal products. They tend not to sell other people's products, but mm. the founder Scott and I became friends, and he really believes in the product yeah. and uh, agreed to allow us to launch it on their website, which is great because they're just all around the world. That's cool. I'm glad that the listeners learned about that. I didn't know about that website. So when I listen to the podcast, I'll write it down and check it out. Um, I was trying to figure out how long ago it was when you first sent me a bottle because I've been using it for a while. Um, I have to say maybe been four years ago. Yeah. I started making it a, a form of it as soon as we moved to our property, which is in 2012. And so it would have probably been a few years after that when we really actually had a full blend because at first we were just making a single ingredient of wild St. John's wort, which I'd be excited to share more about as we get into it. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing too is, is when I got it from you, it was, it's a, it was a pretty decent sized bottle. Is the bottle still the same size as the ones that you gave me today? Yeah. It comes in a one ounce bottle. You know, I know it's a very high end product. It's not cheap. What is it? A bottle? It's 160 for the ounce. The thing that I noticed about it is it lasted a long time. Yeah, it, especially depending on um, you know your skin condition. Super healthy skin doesn't really require skincare products. Yeah, um, and obviously, super healthy skin is sort of a generally healthy person on mm-hmm. the whole because mm-hmm. uh, the skin is going to reflect whatever's going on. You know better than anyone. And so, yeah, I'm not surprised that you don't require much of it. And then. Also, say you're in a humid climate, you might only need a little bit, but if you're in a super dry climate, um, mm-hmm. you might use more. See, for me, because I shave my head, um, my head gets so much sun exposure and I keep forgetting to put a hat on and burning myself. And oftentimes, my the, the, my scalp gets itchy just because it's hot and dry out here, especially in the summertime. And I'll, I'm also lifting rocks a lot and getting dirt all over my head. And so by the time I get done with that, my skin gets dried out. But the I've always had this challenge that, and Penny can tell you, she's bought me a million skin creams, even very expensive ones from all over the world. And they're either too thick and sticky. And by the end of the day, I feel like every dust particle in the world is glued to my face and head, or they dry out and I constantly have to keep applying them. And when I got your serum, it was the first time I finally had something I could put on in the morning. And what I would do is I would, and this might have been why it's lasted so long, as I found if I put a little bit of organic skin cream in it, then it felt like it was the right balance for my scalp and my face. Mm -hmm. So I put a little mix of, just like a little drop of a Walita skin cream to kind of mix it in and let it spread all over my face. It spreads just fine, but I just found that that balance worked for me and and then I didn't have to deal with this constant battle of too sticky and gooey, uh, too thin, because like the Walita alone won't do it for me. But when I put your serum in there, it makes magic. Yeah, well, like the the prime use you, you could say would just be using it uh, as you would apply any oil. However, mm-hmm. we do do all sorts of fun stuff like that. Like we'll add it to clay and dried flowers, cr- mm-hmm. crushed up flowers and clay. Uh, moisture from the serum, maybe also a hydrosol. We distill our own essential oils and hydrosols on site from the herbs and flowers. And mm. so we can add a little bit of that together and make a mask using, right. using the oil as sort of the carrier. Yeah. And there's lots of times I use it straight up. I, I use it straight up on my hands, especially after lifting rocks because they get kind of ripped up and sore, like raw. Yeah. The other day, our daughter, Kaya, who's five and a half, got, um, was roughhousing with our dog, who's a small pony. Um, in size. He's a German, a giant schnauzer. So he's really big. And uh, his mouth got out there and he basically bit her. Um, and the cut, the doctor, you know, we, we texted it out to a couple doctor friends of ours. 
was to definitely, you know, if that came into their office, definitely a stitch and antibiotics. And instead, we just put our serum on for about three or four days and it disappeared. It was unbelievable. Right on. Yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, and so I, and I've used it on my, um, uh, my groin. Uh, sometimes I get, like I think I've told you, I get uh, food reactions if I eat things that I know I shouldn't eat because my body doesn't like them, but they're things that are celebratory for me, like my popcorn and um, Penny will go to the farmer's market and there's a lady there that makes these gluten-free treats that are as good as anything you could ever find with gluten in them. It, like, like, it's just sexy, hot, delicious, high-end, organically farmed products. So sometimes I give myself permission to eat a chocolate chip cookie or a chunk of a donut or something. And my body will react, but I would, I'll put the uh, serum on my skin and it's very, very helpful. And uh, I just found it to be, that's why I kept buying. I kept telling you, I want to buy more. I want to buy more because I just found that uh, I could not find anything that made my skin feel that good and healthy. I'd be lying if I said you were the first person to enjoy it in their groin. So other people have enjoyed it. Other their, people have enjoyed it in their groin as well. Yeah, oh, yeah. For other things? I'm not exactly sure. I don't follow up with too many questions on that. But <laughs> I, I, I have gotten some feedback. <laughs> the look on your face is way too mischievous for just this to be a skin thing. Oh, I thought we were on video. I, uh, I have... Um, I have. Are a, you saying it's a sex lube? I'm just saying I have a client in New York who's bought quite an inexplicable amount of bottles <laughs> how many wives does he have <laughs> um i don't know maybe that's the problem yeah. <laughs> maybe he's alone too much you know yeah. <laughs> on lockdown that's a lot of money for that <laughs> yeah yeah just imagine how it shines though yes exactly <laughs> no friction burns yeah a real trophy oh piece. my god but, oh um, yes so yeah. sorry for taking you down the drain there but you know we're still young us young you know i'm uh i'm going on 59 minus 30 but um i know where your wheelhouse is yeah exactly but i like to know the truth so that's good so yeah no it's an amazing product and i really wanted to share it with all of you because i really think um you know a lot of my clients are successful people and i work with a lot of women and a lot of my female students they they all love to care for themselves and you know who wants to have ugly skin right and who wants to have uh pimples and who wants to have uh just a body that doesn't have uh the support it needs i i, I when i find something really good i feel like god i got to tell people about this it's too good to keep secret yeah support is the key word i think that you said because yeah. that the product will support you but i mean that's different than trying to correct or do something that generally cosmetics are geared towards doing yeah you know, some particular purpose uh this is a sort of uh you know much more subtle but at the same time powerful solution which is to generally support the well-being of your skin's natural performance right yes one of the things i noticed about it too that came to my mind that i wanted to share and you don't i don't have this happen very often but when i put it on like say i put it on my scalp or on my face it actually feels like my skin's drinking it in. It's not sitting on the surface like a lot of products. It seems to be pulled into my skin. Yeah, uh, there's a whole sort of um, spectrum of oils and their ability to penetrate into the skin. Our product is primarily olive oil. It's actually the only oil in it. The other ingredients are the botanicals that we infuse into the olive oil. And so olive oil is somewhere in the middle of that range meaning that it does um, soak well into the skin. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I mean, you're, you're, the reason for moisturizing in the first place is to support your skin's ability to have a nice sort of oily, fatty layer yeah. to, to the exterior of the skin. And so it not soaking in completely and performing that layer, I mean, you could just think about the cosmetic industry's version of that would be mineral oil or like petroleum jelly that you could just smear on the outside of yourself mm. and it would block all the moisture from leaving. And so it's effective in that sense, but I mean, what are the ingredients in it and how is it achieving that effect? So in our case, olive oil has an ingredient in it 
It's rich in squalene, which is one of the ingredients in the oil of your skin, in the sebum of your skin. And so a common ingredient in cosmetic products is squalane, which is its cousin, right? Mm -hmm. Not squalene. Squalene is rich in shark liver, which mm -hmm. is why millions of sharks are harvested for the cosmetic and oh skincare industry. Oh my God, industry. that's sad. But squalene is, um, you know, I guess it would probably oxidate quickly or something. Mm -hmm. It's not super stable uh, in, the, in that form. And so they hydrogenate it mm. and that becomes squalane. And, oh, okay. and that's, so they say, oh, squalene is good for you. Let's give everybody squalane. But in this case, olive oil is rich in squalene. And so it's, you know, your, your skin knows exactly what to do with it. Plus your, it's a fat and your, your membranes of your cells are largely fat. So it seems like because it's a fat, it's going to probably uh, want, the body's going to want to put it in the membrane where the fat is because it's going to be useful there. You know, but the body doesn't try to reinvent the wheel. You know, there's so much about you that, that I want to share. And we're only just talking about the one product. I was just trying to let everybody know that I've, I've had, not only have I had some of the best food I've ever had in my life and the best skin oil, but Jared actually grows the best marijuana I've ever had in my entire friggin' life. <laughs> and and uh, I, I did encourage him to go into that business a while back, but he wasn't really how he wanted to make his living. And uh, I can tell you, though, that if, if you've uh, ever wondered if biodynamic farming is better than organic farming, then you find the best organic pot you can find in the world and fly up and see Jared and he'll show you what marijuana can really be. <laughs> you know, I'll agree to that only in so much as biodynamic cannabis is the best marijuana that you can find. Yeah. And of course I love ours the best. Yeah. Um, we grow it personally, a residential amount, which is, you know, legal here in California, yeah. but we're intending actually to continue uh, developing and looking into um, either hemp or cannabis, uh, especially in so much as it could be used in some of our skin and body care treatments. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can but you thank you for the compliment. Oh yeah, no, it's like I've told you every time I get some, it's like holy shit, this is a whole new level. And now a lot of you listening are probably thinking, oh, it must just blow your mind, you know, like it's super strong. But it's not that it's like so strong, like a lot of these new fangled laboratory pots. Oh it's no, it's just the opposite. It's like smoking sunshine, baby. And moonshine. Yes. It's just so clear and so calming. And I feel like I'm one with the kingdom of the marijuana plant and I'm in this state of sunny bliss all the time. Yeah. You know, somebody, maybe you, somebody might know the answer, but it does seem like, I mean, all of the, so the reason why the cannabis is good is the same reason why the watermelons are good is the same reason why the Roman chamomile is good, uh, is because the soil health and the environment and sort of the whole process is good. And so anything that arises in that environment is going to be of the same caliber. And yet the cannabis does seem to let you know that the most, like you can really, really tell, um, its effect on you yeah well i think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's affecting your your psyche more so you know the, the the psychic end of you more so than it is the bodily end of you sure i mean yes it has effects on your body as you know but like if you eat a, a brownie or uh, an apple or a piece of meat your experience of it is more down inside of yourself but when you smoke really good pot it not only affects you on the inside, but your sense of connection to everything around you is so vividly enhanced and things like color perception or enhanced sound. Um, one of the things I loved about yours is that it just brought me into these places where I had, um, it just seemed like my intuition was much more hopped up, you know, like all of a sudden questions I had on my mind and I was waiting for answers to come from great spirit would start just popping up on the radar or I would paint and I would be able to see the visions of what I was painting much better. It's completely dialed in. So I don't, that doesn't surprise me, but you telling me that and knowing that my brother is obviously listening to this episode, just, I can't help but share the time that I, I mailed him a heirloom blue squash. I forget the exact variety and it really blew his lid off. He said he had like a, you know, come to god moment come to god moment. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes we'll have to ask him about it well you know so it can happen from squash and gourds hi everybody do you guys want to know one of my secret weapons that helps me avoid being sick or feeling run down it's organifi immunity 
Organifi Immunity is a super high quality certified organic drink mix that provides daily immune support and supports overall immunity. Organifi Immunity contains whole food vitamins C and D, whole food zinc, mushroom beta-glycans, and provides only natural sweetness. Not only will you support your immune system, but you'll also get on-the-go superfoods in a delicious orange blend that is great for you and your kids and everyone will love it. My family and I love it and it's easy as tearing off the top of the package and mixing it with high-quality drinking water and you can rest a little easier knowing that you're enhancing your immune system, which is probably a good idea now that so many people are spending so much time indoors, breathing indoor air, and lacking sun exposure. Why not enjoy a little immune insurance while getting certified organic nutrients, superfoods, and great taste that's quick, easy, and effective? To get your Organifi immunity and shop their amazing product line with your Living 4D discount, go to O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I dot com and save 20% on any and all of their products using the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20. That's check 20 during checkout. Enjoy Organifi. You know, the thing is, is when you eat really well grown food, especially biodynamic. I remember one time I was in Australia and we were traveling all over Australia for years. I did. And I can't remember where we're at, but uh, I think we were in Tasmania was one place. And we got these, there was a biodynamic farm there and they had eggs and cheese and all sorts of stuff. I can't eat the cheese, but the eggs were unfreaking believable. The yolks were like almost blood red. It was the wildest thing. They were so dark orange. It was almost bordering on red. And when you took a bite of one of those eggs, your whole body got high. It was literally like God's eggs. And they had other foods too that I ate. I can't remember what it was because years ago, <clears throat> but when you get really well-grown food, you really realize that food is medicine, man. And that you can, it's easy to see why people are sick like crazy out there and, you know, constantly dealing with flus and bugs and viruses and parasite infections and low energy. It's just like, holy shit. If you guys knew what food's really supposed to do for you. Yeah. And some of it, you know, two things. One is that some of it's not by choice, right? So if you're in one of the most impoverished communities in the country and your access to food is, say, the food bank, you're now getting basically waste surplus from the worst quality food system that we have. And so it's like, you know, zero times zero kind of. There's, there's, no, there's no gains there. Um, we shouldn't even have that surplus in the first place, perhaps, because, you know, we're maybe need to have a more localized food system and yeah, well, from all, the ground yeah. up. It's all part of the industrial complex of farming and food production. It's a whole, there's so much politics involved. It's a joke, but uh, um, there was something you were leading to me yeah. to there and I lost my train of thought. But uh, anyhow, well, what I'd love us to, to hear from you, Jared, is a biographical overview of your life, your education, and, and what, how ultimately, ultimately led you to being a biodynamic farmer, because I know that's not where he started out. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in uh, New Jersey most of my life with uh, my mom, dad, and brother, like you said, and uh, never stepped foot on a farm. Right. If I recall, maybe we went apple picking and to, you know, pumpkin patch kind of thing, but I I'd never had any exposure to agriculture prior to the age of about 28 or so. So, I mean, flashing forward to then, I had graduated from Oberlin College and I found myself working on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And I, thanks to my brother, who had just gone through the beginning of what ultimately became a tremendous transformation from morbidly obese to extremely healthy, I saw the first phase of that and uh, got introduced to a Czech practitioner. And, you know, looking back, uh, I just kind of think about it as being introduced to the four doctors. Um, and so being introduced to the four doctors um, really cha changed everything, which is why it's a nice full circle moment just to recognize for me right now um, because you know I was on a trajectory at that moment and then I went on a completely different trajectory and basically started moving differently I mean even the concept of working out and working in would have been entirely new at that time um, and so I'm moving differently I'm eating differently I'm thinking differently and I mean you add those three things up 
not only is Dr. Happy doing well, but you're a completely different person. You're moving, yeah. thinking, and eating differently. I'm a completely different person. So at that point, I basically become aware, maybe for the first time, of what I do and don't like. I, I, I had you know, gone into football, gone into soccer, gone into these things because my older brother had done them, gotten into drumming, gotten into Wall Street. These are things that my father and brother had done before me, and I didn't really have a clear path, and it just sort of made sense. And then through moving, eating, and thinking differently, I realized that I didn't like my job. Um, I didn't have a future in it. And I loved cooking Mm. and farming. That One led to the next. I started cooking a lot at home. I stopped going out. I stopped drinking. I stopped going partying, clubs, etc., um, which I also followed my brother into. <laughs> um, but <laughs> Big I, brothers, they can be dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got to look out. But um, so sweet and brotherly. But um, so I, uh, I, I get into cooking. That's where I was. And I start a blog called I'm High on Cooking. And that really focuses my attention on the topic. Weren't you in hotel and restaurant management school or something like that at some point? I mean, where this leads is that we leave the city. This passion turns into a confluence of circumstances between my father and I, where we decide to partner on the development of this land-based project. And so I leave the city to go take on a series of apprenticeships, first on a biodynamic farm, uh, at that point, my then girlfriend, Velisa, who's now my wife and partner and, you know, all around muse. Um, and she moved down with me. We both took on a second apprenticeship at a resort in Tennessee called Blackberry Farm, which now has a second property called Blackberry Mountain and their Relais Chateau Resorts, which is an international organization of world-class hotels. Um, and so we did that in anticipation for this project that we now have called oh, B. Yeah. Be here, farm in nature. Is okay, the, so the name of it. So you were actually doing that to get the knowledge and experience that you would carry to be here. The original sort of spark of a vision was that there was going to be a, a organic farm. Is probably how we would have described it at the time. But now I would say a regenerative farm. We were going to have a regenerative farm, and we were going to stack on top of it some sort of entrepreneurial business that would make the farm, you know, much more financially viable. Which the whole history of farming has been, you know, less and less profitability and less and less yes. humans farming, right? Mm -hmm. So Joel Soliton actually was a big inspiration right around, you know, during this time when I'm being introduced to the four doctors, I read a book by Joel Soliton, um, a farmer from Virginia called You Can Farm. Mm -hmm. And um, I know who he is. Yeah. yeah, he was featured in Michael Pollan's Omnivore's Dilemma. The whole section on regenerative agriculture is about his farm, Polyface Farms. Right. Mm -hmm. And so... He wrote many books, which are of great interest to people in farming. Um, but You Can Farm is a book pretty much aimed at people who are not farmers and want to mm -hmm. think about it. It's good to know. I read the book and I said, I can farm. Yeah. He's very convincing. And um, so that kind of kickstarted it. And the idea that he has in the book is, yes, I get it. Farming is not profitable. But what if you have a farm that has pasture that grows grains that cows come eat then the chickens follow and then the hogs follow and then you sell all that to restaurants and then you have tours and he basically was stacking multiple farming functions onto a place and having a profitable business i looked at that i'm in new york at the time i'm sort of seeing the farm to table food movement in brooklyn um, and i'm thinking oh these imagine if one of these places was on a farm Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some examples like that uh, outside New York. There's a place called Blue Hill Stone Stone Barns at Blue Hill at Stone Barns, and that's a super fancy restaurant on a farm that does educational stuff as well. Mm. And so I'm seeing these places, getting inspired by what I'm reading. We head off to take those apprenticeships, and ultimately the family purchases the 300 acre uh, piece of land on Spring Mountain, which is just outside of St Helena. And uh, basically on the county line between Napa and Sonoma in Northern California. Um, and so we've been there since 2012 um, and uh, really started rehabilitating the land immediately upon moving there because it had been, I mean, the whole area uh, north of San Francisco historically was logged for redwoods and Douglas firs and stuff to build, you know, the or original San Francisco. And so that continued over the over the years and our forest was 
logged at least once or twice over the last 200 years. Okay. And so what happens after that when you clear cut a forest mm -hmm. is that there's a huge explosion of, of uh, growth of all the species competing for the sunlight and it just comes back super dense at yes. which point it's a fire hazard. So as soon as we started moving to the property we couldn't even get fire insurance due to the, the thickness of right. the, the density. So we began rehabilitating the forest which thinning thinning exactly which leads to rehabilitating the watershed um which sort of leads to understanding holistic land stewardship in general and so we have a, a lake on our property there's mountain lions and bobcats and mm. bears and deer and fox and awesome. so many birds and wildflowers and just that connection with the land sort of began right away um including the rehabilitation of this lady's horse pasture so she had a small horse pasture and um, when you keep horses in one space for too long, it becomes what you call a hard pan. Mm, it's just a pack, super yeah. compacted dead space. Nothing grows. Shockingly, that's where our farm is now. And if anyone had, if you walk around it, you wouldn't believe that it was a dead space where nothing could grow because it's, you know, the it's ultimate alive. picture of vitality, right? Um, there's 300 plus varieties of fruits, vegetables, herbs, and flowers, all of which are just standing you know beautiful and proud and every color and smell you can imagine mm. so it's the opposite of a hard pan and in 2015 so that's three years after beginning this sort of rehabilitation work essentially this hard pan we use a special tool that permaculturists use permaculture is a uh agricultural kind of theory Mm -hmm. about communal living and perennial agriculture. Uh, it's not really executed in any large-scale city or town or anything, but people do it mostly on their homesteads. And so there's been some great information that came out of it, one of which is the idea of no-till or low-till. Not, they're not the only ones, but in particular, they developed something called a keyline plow, which a typical plow that goes behind a tractor, I mean, if you've ever seen, I know you have, but for the viewer, you can imagine like a huge whale tail of soil flying up behind yeah. the tractor. It really just... Kind of like a wake behind a boat. Exactly. It rips open the whole earth and flips it all up, up in the air. And so the opposite of that, this key line plow, it's very, very thin disks that just rip a seam in the, in the soil, mm -hmm. but don't otherwise disturb it. And so we ripped seams on what would have been the natural contour of this land, just looking at the hills around it mm -hmm. and ripping the seams on the natural contour. So the next time it rains, instead of all the water going to the lowest part of this hard pan and getting right. all mucky, it now flows through the seams, bringing the nutrients with it, redistributing water and nutrients throughout the entire field. And we grow a cover crop on this field mm -hmm. for the first time. We let the wildlife graze it. They poo, they pee, they eat in it, they sleep in it. And then the next year, we fence it off and start growing food for the first time. And we hired our farm director, uh, Aton, who's still with us today. It's been about five and a half years um, in 2015. When you grew your cover crop, did you plow it under to feed the soil? That's a good question. The first year, we let the wildlife graze it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the second year, we we fenced it off and plowed it under. The third year, we brought in a huge amount of grass-fed compost, mm -hmm. finished compost, manure, manure compost, integrated that into the field, carved our walking pathways, buried irrigation lines, and began farming in, in, in earnest. Yeah. the Growing a cover crop and plowing it under, you're probably familiar with the term green manuring. Of course. Just for those of you listening, if you're wondering why some farmers are plowing their green crop into their soil. It's because it's feeds the soil. So um, that's very interesting. Quite a journey for for those that may not be. Um, well, actually, before we get to that, uh, I'd like to ask you this question. So the unique question, or the next question I have for you, is: Can you share what it is that you do on your farm that is unique or different than what is done on a typical organic farm? And the reason I'm asking that is, is um, you know, most people listening don't really have much conception of what happens on a farm or, you know, they know maybe organics better food, but they don't really know why, you know? Yeah. So what so is it that you do? The word that I use, uh, sort of the largest umbrella word that I would use to describe us is regenerative farming or regenerative agriculture. And that is a response to industrial agriculture. 
And organic agriculture as well originally was a response to industrial agriculture. However, on the whole, has sort of been co-opted into industrial agriculture. Like you'd have to guess that the overwhelming majority, somewhere I would guess between 90 and 99% of organic agriculture is actually large-scale industrial organic it agriculture. It is, yeah. And so what it means to <clears throat> any one farm really is different. Yes. Uh, everybody absorbs these, uh, like for example, there's the original spirit of the organic movement, which was to have better ecological solutions to industrial farming. And then there's the letter of the law of, of what it means to be a certified organic farm today, which is essentially a list of the worst chemicals not to use. Right. But it doesn't talk about, say, soil health or biodiversity or other aspects of the, the impacts to farming or you know human health, planet health, planetary health, et cetera. So I could speak to our farm, not necessarily regenerative ag or organic ag on the whole. Um, on our farm, as opposed to, I mean, let's just be clear about industrial ag, because we are sort of the opposite of that. And that would be large scale monoculture, chemical fertilizers, chemical pesticides, which includes insecticides, pesticides, rodenticides, fungicides, Fungicides. whatever side they come up with next. Yeah. And and then (laughs) anything uh, they can kill. Yeah. Whatever they come up with. And, you know, over large distances, large volumes, large scale, it involves debt, insurance, you know, it involves large machinery and it produces a lot of quantity of food at a, at a low quality. And so that's industrial farming. And it also destroys the soil. Of course, there's untold external negative costs that aren't accounted for in the price tag yeah. um, of this uh, supposedly cheap food yeah. that is supposedly feeding the world. It's A, not cheap. It's extremely expensive when you count the other costs to society, et cetera. And it's, um, it's not feeding the world very well because it's so nutrient void. It's, you know what I mean? It's uh, empty. So people are full, but missing nutrients. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I came across maybe a year or two ago, I was talking with Dave Murphy, the founder of Food Democracy Now, who uh, him and I did a podcast on the dangers of glyphosate. And he his organization was the first one to successfully sue Monsanto in a lawsuit over the damaging effects of uh, glyphosate. He gave me some research some links to research papers showing that scientists have now found that NPK fertilizers do not break down in the soil. But farmers were always told that they did. Yeah, that's the whole concept is that, you know, it's safe because these things sort of evaporate right. or disappear. So here's what the researchers found. They found that there is so much NPK fertilizer that is now, because of the waters dissolved it, down into the rock bed underneath the soil That if we ever have heavy rains in a lot of these parts of the world where they do a lot of commercial farming, Mm -hmm. that if that water makes it to the ocean, it will utterly poison the entire ocean because there is massive billions of tons of fertilizer that's now settled in the rock bed. Uh, Okay. Well, it's not really future thought because here's a picture of America right now. Yeah. Okay. So you got the Appalachians on one side, the Rocky Mountains on the other, the flat plains across the middle. And we're industrial farming the whole thing. In the middle of that, there's a Mississippi River. Pretty much everything drains into it. goes down into the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. But there's a 9,000 square mile hypoxic dead zone yes. where nothing grows. So that is the perfect picture. Of what's going on. Of what's happening. Yeah. And also, it's a nice picture because I think about myself as downstream from my food. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to look back upstream and see who's shitting in the water and see the whole thing, right? I mean, that's what originally drove me from cooking to farming. I started cooking, which led me to finding higher quality ingredients, which mm-hmm. led me to think meeting where these ingredients were coming from, going out and visiting the farmers mm-hmm. and realizing, you know, ultimately it's actually nature connection more than farming yeah. that I'm, I I became interested in. And so once I had met enough of these farmers and had enough of their high quality food, I realized actually I want to be a part of that process, more involved directly in that process. Paleo Valley makes some incredible superfood bars that are a lot different than what most people think of as a superfood bar. I've got Autumn Smith, the creator of their superfood bars, right here to tell you about them. Autumn, what is so unique about your awesome superfood bars? 
Well, our superfood bars are unique because not only do they not contain refined sugar or GMOs or any of the freaky additives that you'll find in most bars or gluten or anything, but they're just whole foods. They're low in sugar. They're made with superfoods like ginger and broccoli and acerola cherry and collagen from grass-fed and finished animals, which we all know is like a fountain of youth. And so the best part about them, though, is probably the flavor. They come in chocolate and apple cinnamon, and we have so many more delicious flavors to come, and they're easy to put in your bag to feed for you with your kids. And I hope you love them all as much as I do. All you have to do to get access is go to paleovalley.com, and you can use the code CHECK15, that's lowercase C-H-E-K, 15, and you can get 15% off. And I hope you love them. That's awesome. And just so you know, that's P A L E O valley.com. And I know you're going to love Autumn Superfood bars. People don't realize when they're buying stuff that's farmed commercially that they're literally funding the destruction of the planet. You add up all the stuff from all the damage glyphosate's caused and is causing to this day and will continue to cause. All the damage from herbicides, fungicides, rodenticides, pesticides. We look at factors that pesticides are now known as one of the key factors that's causing the rapid decline of the bee population to dangerously low levels. Um, so while we're destroying um, industrial ag real quick, yeah. while, while we're dismantling that system, let's just talk about industrial organic too. Yeah. Right? Okay. Mm-hmm. So for example, and then we'll talk about what we do on our farm, but which was your question. Yeah, good. But for example... Uh, in 2019, one of the chemicals that was approved for organics was removed for the first time. And it has been commonly used, I mean, I think maybe since the 70s. And it is, like everything on that list, derived from natural sources. Yeah, uh-huh. But it's uh, called rhodanone. And it, like I said, it was common. But it's now shown that if you use it, you're two and a half times more likely to have Parkinson's. Wow. And so it's no longer on the list. And yet, if you were buying organic food from a grocery store up until 2019, it, it was it was on the list. And so I don't know exactly all the ingredients that go into organic approved stuff, but on our farm, I'll start getting into us now. Um, on our farm, we don't use any store-bought chemicals, uh, including certified organic ones. So before I get specific on that, I'll just say the underlying principle or assumption that we make when we enter into our farming practice is that the earth is a living sentient being amen with the uh, and the respect that one deserves and so when we hired Aton our farm director in 2015 i knew that we'd be heading into biodynamics Aton had come from a biodynamic farm and yet our understanding and practice today is much different than it was then uh, for both of us and so I wanted to learn more. Uh, and so I asked a friend for a book that he could recommend. I may have actually given you this book years ago, but I asked for a book. He told me to look into this guy named Dennis Close. Yes, I've got two of his books. They're yeah. fantastic. Yeah, he's out there and amazing. Yeah. And so the next morning, which was Aton's first week of work, and coincidentally was my birthday, Aton, ha- having just met me, I'm saying it was particularly kind to bring me a gift. And uh, he brought me... The night after I got told to look into Dennis Klosek, the farm director I had just hired brought me a book by Dennis Klosek called yeah. Sacred Agriculture. And basically our journey, mine, Velisa's, and Aton's, has been trying to understand sacred agriculture for, a, a, and put it into practice. So industrial agriculture is trying to produce a crop. We are producing a crop as a side effect of trying to produce soil health and sort of systemic health. And so... A model of soil health that's easy to understand is just looking at a healthy forest. And certain forests, of course, as they mature, like the redwoods, they become peak uh, ecosystems. And there's actually less biodiversity because it's just those big old huge redwoods and maybe some ground cover. But picture like a tropical jungle, super lush forest. Everything's dying and decaying and recycling back into the ground. And clearly that death is responsible for all the vitality. And so healthy soil has is alive. Yes. The difference between soil and dirt is that you add water to it and it becomes a medium for life. It also becomes colloidal. So it's in between solid and liquid. And in this colloidal state, about six inches deep, maybe 36 inches deep, not even everywhere on the planet. You could picture, I mean, we have super rocky mountains right outside this window. So not everywhere, but somewhere there's topsoil. 
And in that topsoil, all life exists. Mm -hmm. All plant life comes from that, which obviously supports all animal and human life. And so we keep that earth covered on our farm in the same way that the forest keeps it covered. Underneath it, there are, you know, let's say 70% of plants have developed an association with the bacteria in the soil yeah. to interact with the atmosphere and to mutually feed one another. Mm -hmm. The plant will feed it sugars, <clears throat> the, yeah. the bacteria will take nitrogen out of the atmosphere and feed it to the plant. And there's also the reciprocal relationship between the mycorrhiza fungi. I was going to say about 90 or 95% of plants have that relationship. Yeah. And so they don't even call it the soil anymore. They call it the soil glomalin complex. Glomalin is the name of that fungi that lives on the tiniest, tiniest little root hairs of the plants. And essentially, the, the, the fungi, once upon a time, said, all right, I'll eat the rocks. Mm -hmm. And it started eating the rocks and it gave it to the plants. Um, so we want to support that layer of life. And a couple ways of doing that. We grow cover crops, like we mentioned earlier. Cover crops are so nutritious that, like you said, they call it green manure. Mm -hmm. And obviously, everybody knows that manure or compost is also great for farms. So we put compost and cover crops onto the farm. Some of these cover crops do the things that we talked about. They pull nitrogen out of the air. Some of them have really deep roots and go down and make uh, spaces in the soil, which then when they uh, biodegrade, will be an opening which air and nutrients can flow through. All of this decay is eaten by earthworms whose excrement is one of the most celebrated composts yeah. on the planet. Some people farm earthworms just to create that excrement. And then basically you want to focus on what are you planting? So if you have a healthy soil, what are you gonna put in it? And so our focus would be the most biodiversity possible. Biodiversity simply means the amount of life forms in a habitat. The more we know this from our internal you know, biodiversity, we know this from cultural biodiversity, we know this from the health of uh, wild, um, wild lands, the more biodiverse a system is, the more resilient it is. And even just in a practical sense, you can imagine a farmer growing a bunch of things. If a few of them fail and the rest of them don't, the system is more resilient. These diversity of nutrients also decay down into the soil and become a diversity of soil nutrients. So the whole system is more resilient in this way. Once you have a bunch of stuff that you want to plant, the next thing you want to think about is we rotate them around the area so that no one plant is depriving any one space of any particular nutrient at any given time. So if you plant a tomato somewhere, you plant it in a completely different place next summer, and you might not plant it in that place for several seasons yeah so you don't deplete the soil right and then the last kind of nuance of biodiversity is the idea of companion planting which is that certain things grow better together and certain things hinder their growth and this is sort of a play on the entourage effect it's also kind of the reverse of a saying that you hear professional chefs say which is that if it grows together it goes together so you could look at things that go well together in a kitchen and you, you, there's a high percent chance that they actually grow well together in the field, like peas and carrots, for example. Mm. Um, the classic example of companion planting is the Native American system of three sisters garden. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. The three sisters are their three staple crops, corn, squash, and beans, which you can imagine planting in three separate fields. Oh, yes, I have heard of that. Yes, now that you say it. Right. So sh I should go into it though. Yeah. It's interesting. Whatever. Yeah, sure. So the corn grows up vertically as anyone can picture. And instead, then the beans grow up the corn as opposed to needing to trellis the beans, which, you know, you grew up on a farm, anything you have to do on a farm that takes time is, could be, is, is a problem. So then the beans are growing up the corn, but the beans are also excellent at, at bringing nitrogen into the soil, which the corn desperately needs to grow. The bean roots, which are doing this, are also supporting the corn and giving it strength from toppling over because right. it becomes very tall. And then lastly, the squash, if you've ever seen a pumpkin patch, they sprawl out these huge, big kind of elephant ear leaves. They shade out the ground. Mm. They eliminate weed pressure. And of course, you have three crops in the space of one. And also all three crops store for a long period of time. 
and have a diversity of nutrients, sort of like a complete, you know, one's got protein, one's got carbohydrate, they got different vitamins and minerals. So their entire staple vegetables of their diet were mm -hmm. grown through this method of companion planting. I love the beauty of nature, you know. I, I just wish more people in universities would study nature instead of <laughs> trying to figure out ways just to try to control it, you know. Yeah, I mean, th if you wanted to describe it in a layman's term, like in a, as simple as a possible way, you could say that we're trying to emulate nature. We are doing it. We are, our interaction as humans is pretty unnatural. So our interaction in, in the field is we're trying to emulate nature, but our interaction is still unnatural. Um, and so there, the more unnatural the sort of the more external external negative costs and so here's a paradox for you, though. yeah i'm going to throw you at a, a phys philosophical curveball no, buckle up you said that you were talking about how you know the the three sisters and the way you use those on a farm is copying nature but it's not quite as good as nature right i was just saying that we're acting a little bit unnatural in terms of opening up the soil and planting a specific food in a specific place, watering it with irrigation. Yeah. And so there's sort of a check and balance involved that we just have to be aware that we want to be supporting the soil and, and the diversity. Yeah, I, I understand. Be because because it just, in my mind, it, it brought my awareness of a of sort of a controversial topic that it would be fun to just see what your thoughts are on. And the controversial topic is this, where does nature end and man begin? In other words, the way we fucked the whole planet up, a lot of people say that we are destroying nature, but a, phil a philosophically deep question. Now, I agree that we're destroying nature, but that's my philosophy. But there, there is a real divide between people who think that all these scientific advancements and 5G that those are expressions of nature because we are nature. But then there's guys like me and you that would say, no, <laughs> you know, nature has been around for 4.9 billion years on this planet and it hasn't ever produced a 5G phone system and whatever systems it has produced have been um, in resonance with all its other systems. Yeah. You know, but you see my point. The question is, is the human being nature itself or are the things that we're doing somehow external to nature, like we're alien to nature? That's the philosophical kind of, you have to almost choose a side there. I, I get it. I, I we'll see where I land. I don't know if I'm maybe on a third side. You tell me. But uh, this we'll is what I, <laughs> this, yeah, this is my response to that, which is that I think, of course, we're nature. And yet I think that through our ability to think so much, yes. we've thought that we're not. <laughs> I, and and i think that I, I think that i can prove that sorry i think that i can prove that that's funny you know the thing is is homo sapien sapiens is means aware that you're the ape that's aware that he's aware yeah, right me. but the problem is is that we've gotten so aware of other things other than what we should be aware of and our thoughts are driving us deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole and disconnecting us further and further from the shall we say the the uh, animal body that is an uh, that is a product of an unnatural interface with nature right like you wouldn't find obese animals in nature unless it was a hippopotamus or that was their specific design for thermoregulation or a specific protection, right? Yeah. But you don't have, you know, 85% of the population of the world's animals on medical drugs and they no. don't have drug stores and they don't light forest fires. <laughs> no. It's like, so somewhere the thinking and the ape started to part company and that's when shit starts happening yeah and i i try i spend a lot of time thinking about that because like i said regenerative agriculture is a response to industrial agriculture and so i, I constantly try to wonder well what was that you know how did we get there how did we get there where did this mentality start yeah and um so i, I am fascinated by that and part of that mentality divide 
I think you'll you'll point back to is kind of the last thing I would say if you're asking me what's what's different about our farm. I think it's something that you and Dr. Happy would be particularly interested in. Yeah, well, I like Dr. Happy, so if he's interested, I'm interested. I I know. And so it's basically the idea of ceremony and ritual yeah, and festivals. That's amazing. And so we that is a big part of our process and it's actually still a big part of the human con- consciousness, uh, e- even though we intellectually might not even be aware of it. But when we get to certain moments, like the Saturn and Jupiter conjunction that happened over the holidays, or any solstice, even like mainstream media will mention it's the solstice. It's not like they're watching and noticing, like our ancestors, that every single day the sun has been rising in the sky, and now all of a sudden it's stopping and starts falling towards the horizon every single day, Yeah, it's sort of like a nightmare. And so we still know it's important because we're all like, hey, it's the solstice. But it doesn't go much further than that unless you're in a culture like in Scandinavia where they have midsummer festivals. And so they'll light bonfires. Originally, it's because, you know, it depends on your culture, but you had lots of reasons why. Maybe it was to give the sun more force for the next coming season. Maybe it was to scare away the demons Mm -hmm. that inevitably would come during these dark periods. And so now we still light the bonfires. And in America, actually, we have Burning Man, which you think, you know, if anyone knows about Burning Man, they'll think, well, that's not related because it's in September. Except the first four Burning Mans were held on the solstice on June 22nd. So Mm -hmm. it, it all comes from the same impulse where the whole sky, you know, there's a huge ball of fire in the sky. And it's not like... It's not like today where you say, oh, it's Christmas. Let's put on the Christmas lights. We lit those bonfires because we were actively participating in nature. And so that was our role. Mm -hmm. And so in continuing with these festivals in present day, we connect to our ancestors and to the original Mm -hmm. lineage of these foods. And so our product that you mentioned, that that, that you were so kind to mention, loving the Summer Solstice Serum, is one of those festivals. And, yeah. And, 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 and that's exactly what it is to us. You mean that's when you harvest it? Well, I'll, I'll explain what I mean because like, these festivals are always celebrating something that's just happening for a moment. Think about like the, um, the cherry blossom festivals yes. in Japan. Mm-hmm. Okay? That, that, that's because it's so ephemeral. It just captures our imagination mm-hmm. so, so, so intensely. Like a moment of birth, for example. Exactly. Right? And, it doesn't go on forever. It's, you're, you're born, and then the next thing happens. <laughs> right. But it's, you know, your birthday is still a phenomenal moment that you celebrate it each year. And so there is a particular flower, which now is called St. John's Wort, but obviously existed before St. John. And it was, uh, it only appears in like a two or three week window on either side of the summer solstice across the Northern hemisphere. So on a longer timeline, like think about on Jupiter's timeline or somebody's much longer timeline, these, these flowers are, they're, they're they're barely there. You know what I mean? Yes. And so even on my property, a three, almost like fireworks going off. Exactly. Three. It's a real celebration Mm -hmm. of the moment. And so it's a 300 acre property. So sometimes we have to hike miles to find one, plant of St. John's wort, which will have 15 or 20 blooms on it. Yeah. And then we'll find another patch and, oh, there's 10 plants here and we have 150 blooms. And so for this three or four week period, I don't know how else to describe it other than what I imagine like a bee pollinating flowers must feel like. Yeah. I become a St. John's wort hunter, as mm-hmm. does our entire family and team. We go around the entire property spending countless hours. I mean, I, I'm sure they are countable, but they feel countless and we'll do it nonstop. It stains your fingertips bright red, which is the active uh, ingredient, um, hypericum, in the St. John's Wort. And so this was always harvested at this time because it's the only time that it grows, right? We didn't have the ability to process it into a <clears throat> pharmaceutical drug. It was just here at that exact time. Right. So we had an exact association with that time. And so it was known to be helpful in preventing those demons or whatever was to come. Mm -hmm. And we laugh like, oh yeah, they're scared of demons. But it is obviously in present day, the most common natural antidepressant, you know, on the market, which I mean, is not a far cry from scaring demons away, right? It's kind of the same exact thing. You know, Bioptimizers makes an amazing product called P3OM, which is a prebiotic product and it's amazing for uh not only helping 
repopulate the gut with uh, friendly bacteria. But as Wade will tell you, it's really, really an amazing uh, product in case you ever feel like you're getting any kind of food poisoning or illness coming on. And Wade's right here with me, and he's the co-founder by Optimizers, and he knows more about P3OM than anybody. But I can tell you this, I've had nothing but excellent results and nothing but positive feedback from all my clients and friends that I've turned it on, turned on to P3OM. So Wade, tell us a little bit about P3OM and, and why it works so well. Well, P3M is, we call it the Navy SEAL of probiotics. Amen. Basi- basically, its job is to kick out the bad guys in your body. Uh, food poisoning is one of those things from bad bacteria. What we've done is we've taken a, an aggressive strain of L. plantarum. We put it into toxic soup, ran a sine wave to keep a few of them alive. And the few survivors, we grow in very specialized medium to make a cultured, patented enzyme that has extraordinary powers. Uh, number one, it survives the intestinal tract. Yes. And number two, it is absolutely hunts down uh, pathogens in the in the body, bacteria, viruses, these type of things. And this is really where the future of probiotics is. It is about developing and culturing and creating super strains of probiotic, very much like the Navy SEALs go through a training, and these yes. individuals mm-hmm. have extraordinary powers to deal with chaos. And in today's world where we want to improve our immunity and our function and our gut health, p through m is head and shoulders above any probiotic out there. So my understanding is it can be used daily as a supplement, but it can also be used in larger quantities as a defense measure. We've tested this uh, literally with over a hundred of our friends who have been suffering from various times of food poisoning. And a handful of those guys When you're in food poisoning and within 20 to 30 minutes, you complete recovery. That's awesome. And I've I've, uh, seen it happen myself. Angie has felt bad a number of times and uh, several of people in the the house or family have. And I say, take 10. If that doesn't feel good in an hour, take 20. And you've told me you can't overdose on them, which is amazing. Yeah, that's the beauty of P3M. You can't take too much. They'll fight off the bad guys and uh, they'll get your digestion rocking and rolling the way it should. So if you want to have a healthy gut and you want some defense, carry P3OM with you wherever you go, airplanes, cars, business meetings, hotels, conferences, and you've got your Navy SEALs in the bottle and they're ready for you anytime. Wade, how do we, we get a hold of your amazing P3OM product? Super easy. Just go to www.bioptimizers.com slash living4d and put in Paul10 for your 10% discount code. That's B-I-O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E-R-S.com slash living4d and Paul10 for your discount code. You got it. There you go. Try it. You'll love it. I use them. I can't tell you enough how much I love this product. I think it's a genius product. And you've heard it right from the master himself. Get your P3OM. Let us know how you feel about it. Lots of love. You know, one of the things that you were talking about is, is for example, the natives worshipping the ball of fire in the sky. But they're, they're, most people don't really understand that when these people had rituals like solstice rituals and many other rituals, that they we're in the magical and mythic levels of consciousness. And so for them, a tree was a being, a plant was a being. It wasn't, it was like me in you, know, me and you, uh, like if, if I run into you and you're walking your dog, I'm meeting you and another being a dog. But just like I talk to you, they, they talk to these things. They ask them questions. That's how shaman learned how to make all the formulas and medicine men. The plants and the trees taught them how to do it. So the, the point is the same as their relationship with the sun and the same as their relationship with planets that we can see, like Venus, for example. Their consciousness connects to those things, not as material bodies like most people think to you know, mercury or whatever is a ball of rock or gas. They don't think it's really alive, but they've, because the reason they don't think it alive is because they don't know uh, how to communicate to it or how to listen to it or to feel it. So the natives were having these very, very important ceremonies because they had to do with the relationships that they had with the plants and the animals and the plants and the animals were 
also sharing with them what is important and why is this time of year important? You know, why do we only make this seed or this product like you were talking about St. John's Word at a certain time? So, you know, Joseph Campbell talks about uh, uh, one of the Native American tribes that he worked with. Actually, Carl Jung talks about it. And I can't remember what tribe it was, but he went and met these people and he wanted to meet the chief because he'd heard about the chief and it was a very wise man. So he was, the chief was telling him, uh, Joseph, I think uh, Carl Jung asked him, well, what is it? What do you feel your people's function is? And essentially what he said is our people's function is to carry the sun across the horizon. So their, their relationship with the spirit of, of the sun was such that they in their own psyche felt that their function on earth was essential because without it, the sun would not move across the horizon. So somehow, some way, that information is coming to them and it's driving the way they behave and the way they live. And so all these rituals, what I'm saying, it may look like somebody said, oh, let's just put this solstice holiday here, or let's let's celebrate this on this day. It's not like people are just arbitrarily, you know, Christmas is the one that's the most suspect for that, because there's lots of evidence that Jesus probably wasn't born on that day for a lot of reasons. But these are actually part of the internal workings of the earth itself. Yes, we're participating we're carrying the sun across the sky. That's exactly the perfect picture for participating in nature. It was a critical role. And I mean, you probably know this, which is why you alluded to it, but it I'm sure it has nothing to do with Christmas. It's probably just a coincidence. But the Romans celebrated Saturnalia, which ends on December 25th and is celebrated by bringing green, leafy uh, conifer trees into your house and lighting candles. So... That's because the sun is at the winter solstice and because we're begging the light to come back. And so these things are the human being nature. That's all that's happening. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know what I mean? So it's the trees are doing what they're doing and the people are doing what they're doing. It, we didn't have to think about it. It was, a, it, was a, a, it was understood that the other side, which we couldn't see, let's say the spiritual world, was feeding us and we needed to feed it in return. Yes. It was a circle. And in that period of human evolution, we were all animists, what, are, what would be classically today called an animist, which is a person that believes that it's God that's animating everything. It's God. God is in the stones. God's in the sky. God's in the trees, the bugs. Everything that's here is an expression of the divine and the, the essence of it, what makes that tree grow or that bird fly or or breathe is the intelligence the consciousness and the force of god dreaming it into existence right so you know think of the cost to the planet and to us for becoming materialistic and convincing ourselves that everything that we are was created magically out of a biological process that happened all by accident from the big bang onward and that this is just nothing but rock and plants are just plants and who gives a shit, cut them down, drive your car over them. You know, it's, it's just a big rock, this place. Let's just get the minerals, the gold and what the fuck. It's all, it's just here. Let's use it. Right. Yeah. That, like that compared to animism. Now you see, you know, what drives a, a behavior like that oddly, is monotheism. Why? Because most monotheistic people actually believe there's only one God, and that God is not here. That God's not on this planet. You pray to that God somewhere else, and maybe that God is in heaven, but it's not here. And the biblical sort of story of the fall, and you're going to be punished now that you eat from the tree of good and evil, you got to toil in the rocks and the thorns. So, People want to die and get the fuck to heaven to get out of here, right? So they're like, who cares about the planet? We're trying to get out of here. That's sort of the Christian trap. And, and so if we, if we actually looked at current scientific and research in biology, and there's some very amazing research like, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Gagliano. Yeah, Gagliano, exactly. Her, her thus spoke the plant. 
And I, you know, look at the research of Julius Chandler Bose from all the way back in the early 1900s showing that plants do have nervous systems, that they're very conscious. <laughs> you know, like if we don't reconnect to our animistic roots, we might just scientize ourselves to death. Yeah, I didn't mention that when we were talking about forest health, but there's also all sorts of interesting stuff we know about the trees communicating via the fungal network, yes, sending nutrients to their friends and loved ones. Up until uh, up until and including keeping uh, you know, grandfather and grandmother trees alive by feeding their stumps for up to a century after they die, they 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 claim to somehow yes. track that. Um, so all of that is sort of fascinating, and we don't really think that it stops in the forest either. And of course, science, you know, maybe we'll get there, and maybe we can support some of these claims in the future. But in the meantime, scientific solutions to food or human health haven't been successful. Um, they've actually been damaging. And so the biodynamic solution, which is something that I, I think we could talk about a little bit more right now, uh, because a lot of what I shared about what we do on our farm uh, would be done on most biodynamic farms and a lot of regenerative farms and some organic farms. And then a few things that we do uh, would only be done on biodynamic farms. And yeah. so well, I'm often asked, what is biodynamic farming? What is biodynamic agriculture? Um, and if you look it up, it'll tell you that it's a, a holistic style of agriculture inspired by the teachings of Rudolf Steiner, who is the founder of a body of wisdom known as Anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. At which point you have more questions than answers to that. To that, that doesn't answer anything. Um, so that sort of, as a biodynamic farm owner, um, looking at our crops and knowing that whatever we were doing must be working, I became extremely interested in the origins of biodynamics. And the thing is, is you don't have to even understand why or the origins of biodynamics to farm biodynamically. Theoretically. Some cons you could hire someone who understood biodynamics and then told you, do this on a red day, do this on a blue day, do this on a green day, plant this here, plant that there. You, you could go through biodynamics as a method um, without really understanding it, and it would be a phenomenal beyond organic style of agriculture. Um, so understanding it leads you to um, the, the ideas and the concepts behind what became the certified process, meaning that this gentleman gave a series of lectures in 1924. He didn't create a style of farming. He gave a series of lectures, and then people in his community worked on that information after his death and then codified it into a certifiable system which could be replicated. It also um, was turned into sort of a language that hopefully anyone could understand and apply anywhere. Yes. So that means it was um, sort of stripped of a lot of the intent uh, behind it for good reason, meaning like if if you came into this, so let me back up a second, because about these lectures were given to a specific community and the community was the anthroposophical community, which is a, a body of wisdom that would self-identify as a spiritual science, mm -hmm. which sort of makes the modern mind be like, what are you talking about? That doesn't even make sense. So, well, it it it, it does if you have enough knowledge. Well, it, it does for you. Yes, but it means the study of causes, authentic I, causes. I agree with that as well, but you have to agree that it's a far cry from a uh, average. American citizen from thinking that the spiritual world is the cause of the physical world in this day and age. Well, yes, and and you know it's like uh, trying to ask a three-year-old uh, a question about what's the best investment in the stock market. A, a person has to reach a certain level of uh, development and, and consciousness to to understand, you know, what's really going on around them. Is what I'm saying. Right. And so this organization or body of wisdom or spiritual science that he founded uh, was very much focused on questions and several of the things that we've brought up so far that seem sort of unanswerable by science are easily answerable by biodynamics. They're just not scientific, so people want to throw them away. And yet one works and one doesn't, one's scientific, one's spiritual. And so that sort of led me to want to understand why and more. Yeah. And so... 
by the time he's giving these lectures, which are the inspiration for biodynamic agriculture, he's giving them at a, in a community called the Gurtanam, which is a university, basically, mm -hmm. and a performing arts center that is entirely based on anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. They have different sections, like the science section. This becomes is that Steiner's school it's, in Germany? Yes, it's like because one, one of them got the first one got burnt down. So they built one, it burnt down, and then he designed one out of concrete, which they built, and it is still standing and existing and operating. From my understanding, the first one got burnt down by people that, for some reason, were against anthroposophic medicine. They definitely um, suspect arson, and uh, there were. Um, sort of assassination attempts on Rudolf Steiner um, mm -hmm. that uh, I've read about. And uh, certainly by the time World War II comes around, there's internet stories of certain esoteric um, sections of the Third Reich actually becoming interested in biodynamic farming. Whereas in general, they were sort of attacked as you know being associated with Jews and mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of bad stuff. Yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah, there's a theory too that Steiner was poisoned, right? Yeah, he does. So he gives these lectures in the summer of 1924. He um, leaves public life from being ill in September and passes away in March. Mm. Um, so these were um, what in present day are considered like almost indications or hints. This certainly wasn't Steiner speaking on this decade after decade after decade, refining it. And um, so, so now I'm, I'm wondering, okay, they've started a philosophical organization that is also interested in architecture and dance and medicine. By the time these lectures are given, they've founded the, the first anthroposophical medicine clinic, which is a, a specific type of homeopathy, to mm -hmm. keep it super simple. They've invented eurythmy, which is a new performing art and, yep. a, and a healing art. Healing art, yep. They've invented Waldorf education, which my daughter is currently enrolled in. And my son's been in since the beginning. Exactly. And so, I mean, besides Montessori, can you even name another education system besides the public school system? It's almost just fascinating that somebody gave a lecture and a school system was created around it. There's a few of them out there, but they're tiny and they're kind of offshoot. I know there's one or two in Australia I've come across that are different. Um, so, I mean, either way, it's... But there's nothing like Waldorf. Man. Yeah. I love it. I mean, I've I've found critical reviews by people saying things against it. But from my perspective of my education and me looking with Angie and Penny at schools for kids and what they offer and what they don't, and me studying Steiner's approach and, and studying... Um, uh, one of the one of Joseph Chilton Pierce's work and a variety of other people it was very clear to us to go with the Steiner. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And so the only reason I'm giving this context is to understand that this was a thriving community with a track record of Steiner inspiring ideas that were being implemented in practical ways and succeeding, and also being sort of revolutionary and completely contrary to the the current paradigm. And which is why some people say he was 100 years ahead of his time, which is right now, which is cool because we get to enjoy it. We need it right now badly. Right. Um, so basically, these lectures that he gave, which are now called the Agriculture Course, at the time, it was a series of lectures called the Spiritual Foundations for the Renewal of Agriculture. And he was giving them to people who had for many years been listening to his hundreds of lectures on the topic of anthroposophy. His students, yes. So it's sort of like walking into the last day of the last year of some graduate school and trying to understand it. He gave a lot of lectures in some of my Steiner books. It says he gave over 6,000 lectures before he died. Right. And a lot of those lectures are sort of required as uh, context and backstory mm -hmm. to understanding biodynamic farming. But that's only if you want to understand it. And yeah. so I, I think that I can share some of those insights in a way that might make people think it's not crazy, but actually makes a lot of sense. I love Symbiotica's products, as you all know. I share them as often as I can because they work and they're made of the best quality resources you can get. And Symbiotica has just come out with a new liposomal activated charcoal that has many amazing benefits. Sherveen, let us know what is the power, the potency, and the use of liposomal activated charcoal. 
Paul, this was an exciting one for us because, as you know, we're from the islands of Hawaii and charcoal is really big over there in terms of detoxification. We make ours using coconuts. And this product's the first time it's ever been in a liposomal form, meaning it's protected to make it all the way down into the gastrointestinal area. And then it really starts taking on its action. Anyone that's got anything dealing with candida overgrowth, exposures to mold, radiation, pesticides, pharmaceutical residues, an overly acidic body, this is a very quick, easy way to provide a rapid solution to any of those issues. If you're dealing with bloating, anything like that, the way charcoal works, it's not an absorber that most people think. It's an adsorber. It's an electrical charge. So it pulls in anything that does not belong in the body into the charcoal and then evacuates and eliminates out. This is one of our top sellers. The reviews on it are incredible. I can't wait for anyone who hasn't used it to try it and just let us know their feedback. Exciting. So if you want to get your liposomal activated charcoal, go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. That's symbiotica.com. And on checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 15 to get your 15% discount. And while you're there, check out all the amazing Symbiotica products because your discount applies across the board. Enjoy. Anthroposophy has an entire worldview going back yes. to an origin story mm -hmm. and a creation story that precedes what you would call the Big Bang. And much like um, other people who have spoken on your podcast about maybe Dr. Kareem or I forget the gentleman who spoke about the Electric Universe. Uh, Walt Thornhill. Right. So it discusses a pre-physical conscious substance that manifests into a physical reality and what rudolf steiner calls it, and first of all that substance has many stages of evolution that i won't get into prior to the point of it manifesting physically the tension between it manifesting physically it unmanifest potential and it manifesting physically that vibration is sort of what the bible calls the word yes that's the ohm and so what Steiner calls that consciousness is the world mineral plant animal mm -hmm. as one word. So we were all united, all the living beings on earth, as one consciousness. The first thing to manifest physically were the mineral celestial planets of bodies of the planets. And so we all have consciousness, yet the minerals are pretty low, low, low vibration. Deep conscious, deeply sleeping. sleeping, deeply mm -hmm. sleeping. The difference between them and plants is what Steiner calls the etheric body or the life force. And so plants are holding their minerals together in a way that we recognize that gesture as alive. If the plant dies, it turns into minerals and decomposes. And we share that with plants. Animals have the astral body according to Steiner's language, which is closest word would be consciousness or awake consciousness, I should say. And so the animals are awake. And this all starts to sound like Rumi. Um, mm -hmm. The minerals, we sleep in God, the... God sleeps in the minerals. Oh, no, God uh, sleeps in the minerals, dreams, dreams in, in the, the plants, plant, moves in the animals, and realizes himself in man. Right. So I'm not exactly sure how directly inspired this is by that, but it feels identical mm -hmm. because the difference between having the astral body or the etheric body is that say if we lose our consciousness we lose our astral body and we go into a coma they say we look like a vegetable so we know it in our language like oh look he's being like a plant yes that's the difference between asleep and awake and then humans different from animals for having realized the i ego consciousness i am like we were talking about earlier i am clearly separate from nature Mental so body. let me manipulate it and so this understanding i mean this creates an entire non-physical world that supersedes and underlies mm -hmm. the physical world that's the spiritual realm and exactly and so that is where steiner's problem with modern science is is that their logic stops right there and yeah. so he extends it beyond that mm -hmm. um, by specifically naming and identifying and differentiating these types of consciousness. Of course, there's the spirits of, say, like a tree or yes. a town mm -hmm. or a country. And then, generally speaking, the elements that we can see, touch, taste, and feel, earth, air, water, fire, these have elemental beings behind them that are not necessarily different from them, 
they're the same as them. They're saturated within each other. And bah- higher than them are what he would call elementary beings, elementary beings, which are shaping and sort of the artisans of these elemental beings. They're the laws of nature, which are moving the elements around, mm-hmm. blowing in the wind, for say. And then higher than them still are the spirits of the rotation of time, which are the planetary geometries and the orbits that are controlling the solar system, which yeah. clearly, if we had a cut to video thing, I would ask people to Google the helical vortex model of the universe. Mm-hmm. Have you ever YouTubed that? Mm-mm. So like, you know, when we grew up in school, they would have drawn the heliocentric model of the universe right. on the board and they would have showed us where the plants, the planets are and how they uh, elliptical around the sun. And yet it would have all been flat. Okay, well, that's not what's happening. And if you look at a vortex or helical 3D model on YouTube, you'll see that the sun is rocketing like an at like a meteor like a comet yeah. like a comet through outer space whipping around a black hole and we're spiraling S- exactly like a like a horse's tail moving behind the horse that's a great picture and when you actually you know the youtube thankful thankful for these 3d models in a sense because if you just can look at that vi- a video of it you see all of a sudden it makes perfect sense why well, you shaved yours off, but why the spiral on the back of your head and your hair is spiraling and yes. why the sunflower is spiraling mm-hmm. and why the whirlpool and the river is spiraling. Mm-hmm. It makes perfect sense because you can see that the geometries and rotations of these planets around the sun, around this black hole, mm-hmm. are what is, is what creates the conditions for life on Earth. It it's becomes very clear. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And one could also say as half metaphor, half reality, the movement of the sun, the stars, and the planets, etc., are stirring the ether, the ocean of cosmic consciousness in its first state of creative potential, which is the fluid that becomes something that creates, right? So if you imagine, like, look at cymatics, right? So if you think of each of these stars, planets, as putting off its own vibration like a musical instrument as it's moving through space it's creating cymatic patterns that ultimately show up as life forms like the spirals and vegetables and everything we see around here like seashells exactly and so steiner says very similar thing in that these shapes that are created by the looping planets etc are repeated over and over in all these life forms and so for example our bladder or Mm -hmm our skull, these Mm -hmm. different things are just repetitions of these larger patterns. Yeah, And so he goes further to suggest that plant life in general is directly related to the movements of these planets. It is, yes. And so flash forward 50, 70 years, and biodynamic farmers have been tracking this and have developed planting calendars to work with this, uh, meaning planting on days that say a root crop, like a potato, which is totally different than a leaf crop, like a salad, one day is better for planting one than the other. And, mm-hmm. and, and that's due to the location of the moon in mm-hmm. relation to the constellations and the relationships between all the planetary bodies. And you could say yes, but an average person who doesn't work with the earth or study astronomy um, might say, well, and certainly at this time, they would have said, what are you talking about? Because nobody was suggesting that. Although traditionally, of course, ancient cultures would have only had this to rely well, on. Well, they had no television and they didn't have compasses. They had the stars. So the, the, you know, the thing is, is that the, um, the people in those periods, the, the, they, were, they were so part of the environment that... You know, like we walk into our houses, close the door. It's a, you know, it can be doing whatever outside, raining, shining, whatever. Uh, but those people lived in nature, right? You lived in a grass hut. If the, you know, if it got really cold, you knew it. If it got really windy, you knew it. And, and you didn't have an air conditioning system. So, like, your every moment was so tied in to the events of nature. But when you're spending, Imagine spending your whole life being in a relationship with the sky and looking at the sky and having learned from your ancestors that you have to pay attention to certain things in the sky because bad things can happen and they do. 
So you would actually begin observing the moon, but because there's not all this electric buzz around you and you're not all ADD and in a rush and freaked out and stressed out all the time, you actually not only look at the moon, but you feel the moon and you experience the moon inside of yourself. And so you experience the sun from the context of it being a living being. So you're actually palpably experiencing what these energies are doing to you, right? It's just like a lot of people cannot feel my water charger, but to me, it's like really strong, you know, because they're too buzzed out. They, they're, they can't feel a subtle energy. Well, I could tell you that before I learned about the four doctors, I had almost no sensitivity. And the moment I started um, improving my health, all of a sudden, I couldn't stand the sounds and the smells and different things that became overwhelming to me yeah. about living in New York City. I became much more finely tuned. Mm -hmm. um, but so it's easy for you and I to say that because we really believe it. But well, I don't have to really believe it. I experience it. Yes, <laughs> I am one of those people. <laughs> oh no, I meant just the idea that Steiner introduced that the planets are important to plant growth. Well, you know, he also showed. I've got it right here in my library in one of his books. He showed it objectively. Right. And this is when it talks about spiritual science, he is saying that you can actually do spiritual research objectively. And so here's an example Steiner, using his own clairvoyant methods, showed that the, the influence of the planets can be identified in plants. And he showed by knowing the orbit of, say, Saturn. And I forgot how he measured it. It has to do with its time or it's related to the orbit in the book it tells you. But then he shows you that if you measure the ratio of the length of the stem of a plant and where the branches come out. So if it's 12 inches long and the branches come out at these three specific areas, it will have a ratio, I think, to the radius of the arc of that planet. And so he shows how you can see this is a platter. Pl Plant, a plant that's most influenced by Saturn. It'll have other influences because they're all in there. But then he says, here's a one that's uh, more in, uh, oriented to Venus. And so it's going to be more responsive to those energies. But he, he was making the point, and I'm making the point, that he learned this by studying the spiritual influences, not by you know some laboratory experiment. But then when you look at it objectively, it actually is true. Yes. And I, there's there's several sort of common, you know, modern examples that I'd like to give. So mm. people who don't understand it from an intuitive spiritual perspective might yeah. say, might agree that it does make sense. Because we look at the sun and we sort of recognize, of course, that's what plants, plants need the sun to grow. I, everyone can agree on that. We can also agree that the tides are associated with the moons. Everyone agrees on that. That's sort mm -hmm. of common knowledge. And yet we, just like the sun drawn on the blackboard, everyone sort of pictures that in a really static way. Yeah. Like the light, the sun comes up and it's sort of like turning on a light or turning off a light. Yes. Mm -hmm. But every moment it comes up the horizon until it crosses down, it's like this dynamic, changing, different quality of light. And then we understand the moonlight is reflected sunlight, but we don't say, oh, that's just reflected sunlight. We know that moonlight has a totally different quality. And so the the sunlight reflects off the moon and comes down and has a different quality of light yeah. that is raining over everything. The moon is not the only planet that's reflecting back at us. That's why some of the other planets look like stars. Those lights are shining down mm -hmm. on us. Mars, for example, can cast a shadow that you can photograph really? in certain conditions. I saw Whoa. photos of it. Like There's a full moon. And there's a shadow, a big shadow, of course, for the full moon behind the person. And then at a totally different angle, this super faint, ghostly Mars shadow. And I, I don't think it's the only planet that, that has the ability to cast a shadow. And so you can imagine these different light qualities yes. impacting life mm -hmm. on Earth. You could also imagine that as this light is streaming towards the Earth, the electromagnetic field of the Earth gets manipulated in such a way that we develop a several hundred thousand mile tail yeah. known as the magneto tail. And that the full moon, every time there's a full moon, the full moon is in that tail, mm. getting zapped, like totally electrified. And of course, changing the quality of, of light coming down. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the moon, so if you look at our equator and then extend it out into 
space. That's yeah. the celestial equator. Things can be above it or below it relative to us. Sometimes the planets are above it, sometimes they're below it. Sometimes yeah. the moon is rising, sometimes it's falling. When these things happen, sometimes the atmosphere speeds up or slows down, yes. which makes the planet speed up or slow down. Mm -hmm. And when one happens or the other, you can imagine the jet stream flying horizontal across the ocean, or you can imagine the atmosphere looping and some huge tropical storm coming north mm -hmm. or some Arctic storm coming south. And so these relationships are driving life on Earth in a very real way. And so a biodynamic farmer understands this and says it's almost crazy not to. Like it's almost like they think that biodynamic farmers are crazy for looking at the planets, and mm -hmm. a biodynamic farmer thinks you're crazy for not. And a, and a, and like a easy example is there's this beach that the family loves to go to down by where our rental house is, mm -hmm. and there's this area where you got to climb over some really big rocks to get from one beach to the next beach. It's sort of a five minute rocky climb. You can only do it at low tide. If you did it at high tide, you could easily die. The mm -hmm. waves would be swallowing these rocks up. Planting without observing the planets is like taking that walk at high tide. These forces exist. And yes. so what, what Steiner is introducing is the idea of replacing power with rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so there's certain nodes that exist in this polyrhythmic unity within which certain things can happen in a different way. Mm -hmm. Meaning when the moon is rising up, that is drawing the energy up mm -hmm. and it's associated with uh germination of seeds yes so the seed will be much more likely to sprout and mm -hmm. germinate during that moon yeah. whereas when it's coming down the energy is coming down into the earth so if you were to take a baby plant and put it in the ground that would be perfect because its roots would be getting pulled down into the earth if you tried to put a baby plant in the ground during the other type it would not Summer, have for example or just in a in a in a in a ascending moon phase, mm -hmm. the the energy is is generally rising, and mm -hmm. so you want a you it's want it's going to struggle. It's not going to it's not going to have the same kind of like swimming views. upstream, you know. Exactly. So if you're just ignoring all of this, of mm -hmm. course you have to use force. But these rhythms exist, and so biodynamics is trying to identify and work with the rhythms. And so from a biodynamic perspective, you could say by taking the rhythms of the planets into our awareness into our consciousness mm -hmm. our consciousness as the human becomes a vector for imprinting the consciousness into the soil and that will come back to us through the food and so when we work the soil meaning like we go open up a bed because we're going to plant something in it mm -hmm. Basically, we're disturbing the water with the imprint of that day. Mm -hmm. So all these planets are moving around and uh, people might have a hard time picturing their influence, but imagine if they were all making a sound. And they do. But imagine we could hear it. Yes. And there was... We can. NASA has many recordings. Exactly. So turn on your headphones and listen to NASA and then just hear how Saturn's like... And the, and the sun sounds like a Buddhist a monk in a cave going... Oh. And then we got... And then we got a comet shoots by. It's like... Oh. Okay. So we got all these different sounds. And that's like the radio station... And listening to that radio station is what life is doing at any given time. Yeah. And so a picture, a plant growing is sort of a picture of that entire system. It's, it's, a, it's an idea that the system had mm -hmm. that is coming to fruition mm -hmm. and that we can see it, but it's becoming, right? It's yeah. not a static thing. It's a process of becoming yes. through time. Mm -hmm. So that's another sort of principle that's and I think introduced. if I remember right, behind the archetype of time in Steiner's system is the archetype of movement. Well, I've got a diagram yeah. of his archetypes in a ring like an onion. There's an incredible and amount of differentiation. Of as these you letters. move toward the center, one of the last ones is time, then movement, and then beyond that, you're at God or still point. Yeah, and there very well might be like further differentiations of the spirits of rotation and time. Which oh, is yeah, what, you you can slice I, it lots of ways. By the way, the, all these rhythms that jared's talking about there is a science named after it it's called astrology and steiner has his own system of astrology called 
um, astrosophy. Are you familiar with that? Uh, only, only a little bit. It's hard to go down every rabbit hole. I've got uh, the three volume set on it and on his teachings written by a man who is considered to be the most highly skilled at Steiner's um, system of astronomy. Or astro- it's astrology, I should say. I'll have to spend a few years looking into that. Yeah, I, I, I read through them just because I was interested. But uh, my favorite guy on that is uh, Dane Rudyard. He's a, a st- astrologer, and he, he's very different than most because he really puts the emphasis on how these very forces you've just described affect the human psyche. So instead of talking about the moon's effect on the water or the plants or Saturn's effect on how a plant grows, Rudyard shows you how those same forces are acting in the psyche of man. And that's why you have, you know, the 12 signs of the Zodiac. And if someone's a Leo, they're going to be a lot different than a Cancer or somebody else. Right. right. That's another example. People totally accept that. They understand they're like, yeah, I am like a Leo. It yeah. makes sense. Uh-huh. So this is happening all the time, whether we want to recognize it or not. And so, you know, those aren't, that's not what biodynamic farming is, but I'm no. just trying to introduce that these, it's basically a different way of thinking about things. And that can lead to a lot of outcomes. Yes, but what you're talking about is things like solstices, which are events in the solar system. They're events in the sky. And I'm saying that the whole thing that is related to the forces that are at certain stages and types and mixtures during these events is the same system that astrology has looked at from a human psychological perspective. Yeah, They're I've, not different forces. Yeah, I follow. And, and so that's important because a lot of people um, understand that, like you said, but the, the problem is, is that like everything, you know, it becomes commercial uh, foo-foo. You read your thing, your horoscope in the paper. I mean, that's just like cheesy as hell, right? That's like um, personal trainer uh, tips out of uh, fortune cookies, right? But, uh, the, the, um, the, uh, anyhow, I, I forgot where I was going, but ultimately what I'm saying is that those are the same forces. Just like, uh, if you, um, take a tuning fork that's tuned to C to a piano and strike it, you'll get sympathetic resonance and it'll sound like someone's playing the piano. But if you do that next to, um, say a harp, you'll get a different sounding response but it'll still be the note c from another instrument so the same resonance the moon has resonance with the plants it has resonance with the water it has resonance with water in us but it also has resonance with parts of our psyche and that's why full moon is busy night for cops right that reversed light is very stressful steiner describes in his uh, some of his books maybe the farming book how full moon is very stressful for plants but it's ultimately what makes them grow it stimulates their growth what do we do we go to the gym and we stress ourselves and the result is we grow so um, and this is why people act so wild on the full moon because they're too close to the edge of themselves already so the extra stress and that type of stress just seems to <laughs> bring the lunatic out of persons yeah. and and so he brings these new ideas basically yeah. And the one real tangible thing that he brings out of these lectures is what are called the biodynamic preparations. Yeah. These are the actual medicines that we make that replace the need for fertilizers, whether it be chemical mm-hmm. or organic, um, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides. All that stuff is replaced by, of course, biodiversity and soil health. But yeah. one of the ways we really support that is with these different homeopathic medicines that yes. are made out of plant mineral and animal based products that ideally although not exclusively in our case or most cases but ideally are sourced from your own farm in our case we have to import grass-fed cow manure for example Mm. we also have to import quartz crystals right we could go digging for quartz rocks on our property but some of them use a horn does he want you to get the horn from your property i mean ideally you have a herd of cattle on your property but Uh. that's sort of you know also coming from the time of where he was and what was going on and what properties were like because you you have to to imagine he's never been to the Amazon, you know what I mean? Right. He has no idea what's going on down there. And so Amazonian... Well, not his body, but guys like me go to the Amazon without getting out of my chair. Yeah, but I'm not sure if he had identified all the appropriate plant species and their relationships to the planets and written them down in the Amazon. Is what I I'm doubt that would be a big job. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> but you could imagine a present day biodynamic farmer. What would they do? They'd have to ignore the letter of the law of biodynamics, which says, get this, get that. And they'd have to be inspired by Steiner's ideas to see, oh, well, in my ecosystem, how right. can I implement that idea? Yeah, That's the difference yeah. between the concept and the method. Yeah, but I think that's important because if you're getting the stuff from your own land, it's in resonance with of your course, land. Of course, of course. So it's like talking to your mother or your father as opposed to some adult you meet on the street that's the same age and the same sex as your mother or father. The, the real depth of the relationship is way 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 more deep and, and this is another concept which is that he believes the farm is not only alive but it's an individual he calls it the farm individuality mm -hmm. and that it has a personality i believe and, I, li I know i've lived a lot of my life <laughs> in a, on a farm right so what are some of these medicines you mentioned the cow horn so yeah. classic one that people hear about is that we put poop in cow poop into a cow horn and we bury it in the earth People are already putting cow poop onto the earth, so why the extra stuff? And so there's always many, many reasons mm -hmm. behind why, because sometimes it's relating to a physical reason, sometimes it's relating to a non-physical reason, and usually mm -hmm. all different reasons are applying at the same time. But the reason why you would put cow manure into a horn is once you look at the horn in relationship to the living organism that we call the cow. And so the cow, unlike, say, the deer, which is super sensitive to the horizon and the atmosphere and its environment, it's constantly scanning and looking around, the cow is focused entirely on the earth. It spends its entire day eating the grass, ruminating, digesting, you could almost say meditating. And it takes this grass into its stomach where it has a huge source of combustion energy. You could picture a tiny little sun in there, lots of energy radiating out in all directions from, yeah. from this heat source. Yes. When the energy gets up to the brain, where in humans we would say, use that energy to look at the cosmos and think about heaven, the cow sends that energy right back down to its stomach because it needs that energy to keep mm -hmm. digesting in its other stomachs. And so when the energy gets down to, say, the hoof or the horn, it's too dense and it returns back up into the cow. It, you don't have to believe this. You could just imagine it. And so you could picture the energy rising up to the top of the cow's head, getting into those horns and returning back down into the center of the cow. And so we take those horns, we fill them with poop, microorganisms from the soil start digesting the poop and turning it into the compost, creating combustion energy. The energy rises up and the horn returns it back down onto itself, mm -hmm. further enlivening this composting process. Mm -hmm. And when they test it in a soil analysis, they find that it does have more soil organic matter than compost that was not treated in this way. Yes. I don't know if you know this, but horns also amplify subtle energies. So yes. they act like an amplifier. So for example, the way you use a charging plate in biogeometry, if you were to take a cow's horn and put a homeopathic medicine in it, it could amplify the strength of it. And one end of the horn has a signal reducing effect. The other one has a signal amplifying. So if you think of a telescope, if I point the big end at you, then I've got the yang end but if i point the small end at you the eyepiece and you look through the other end you're not going to see very much it acts like a magnifying glass so the because i use horns in in healing practices as part of shamanic work and and it's part of what i do and i feel the subtle energy so i know how they work um but there's that all i'm saying is there's that function to it too because it's um, channeling a lot more cosmic energy into the substance. So really the way we would think of it is having more chi. It's more, puts more life force into yeah. what's inside of the Enlivening. Heart. That's the word he would use. So that preparation is sprayed on the soil, on the field. And an example, there's, there's, there's multiple of these, but another example, I'll just give one more, is the uh, what's called the silica preparation, which is made out of quartz crystals. And so we will cush, crush quartz crystals up into an extremely fine powder. And the rule of thumb is that it's fine enough when it starts to float. 
in, oh, oh wow that's into, fine into the air um and we do that first by crushing it in this big device with kind of like a metal rod and a leather bucket that captures all the pieces at the bottom and then we put it on a glass plate with this um specially made glass wand and we do a glass on glass circular motion for several hours until we generate this powder it gets mixed with rainwater buried in the ho- stuffed into the horns and buried in the ground um Ultimately, when it's unearthed, it's mixed back into rainwater Mm -hmm. and sprayed not onto the field, but onto the crops. It's sprayed at particular points of maturation, in particular ripening. And whereas the first one has an association with earthly forces, this one has more of an association with the light and the atmosphere. Cosmic forces. So if you, anyone can look at a crystal, like a quartz crystal and see the light shine into it and sort of prism out like a little rainbow. So we have billions of crystals crushed up into this powder. Every teaspoon has billion crystals or so in it. And we mix this into the water, spray it on the farm. And so now you can imagine all the crops on our farm are just pixie dusted Mm -hmm. with these crystals that the light is shining through and refracting out and Mm -hmm. blasting rainbows Mm -hmm. over all the crops. And so in short, it's basically more light and a higher quality of light that mm-hmm. the plants are digesting. This light is its source of consciousness and information. That's yes. the information it's living on. And so theoretically, or in our perspective, definitely, uh, the plants are taking in more of this information, more of this consciousness. Mm-hmm. And in digesting them, we too are raising our, our level of consciousness. There's other factors too. Um Crystals are amplifiers of a wide range of frequencies, even electromagnetic frequencies. So remember, I don't know if you remember, but radios used to be tuned by crystals. They actually had a piece of crystal in them. And so um, as we're moving through space and the relationships of the planets and the moon changes, that energy is amplified through the crust of the earth. And there's billions and billions and billions of tons of massive crystals all through the core of the earth and under the mantle of the earth. And they're broadcasting the energy and information from the sun and from all the planets in our solar system and all the cosmic bodies whose energies and information is reaching us. So the Earth's crystal, and I think the Earth, I can't remember exactly, but something like 25% of the mass of the Earth is crystal. And I've seen pictures from underground cave expeditions of, of crystals that are like, you know, a hundred tons big. They're massive, beautiful crystals. And there's just tons of them under the Earth. So a lot of the factors that are driving the growth and informing the plant for sprouting and all that are coming from the moon and the other planets and all those little crystals are amplifying those signals. So it's almost like you all of a sudden have a radio that can tune in much more finely to whatever channel it wants to tune into, but it's tuning into all the frequencies that are passing through the earth, like quarks go through the earth, like it's not even there. So there's energies in the ether and energies in the environment and free sound frequencies that are affecting these crystals. So it's the light, but it's also that the crystals are tuning it, making the soil tune right sharply into these uh, essential frequencies, which is one of the things I'm doing with my water charger, except right. I'm programming all that information into the water and drinking it. And, and, and this, this kind of connects that the other medicines are, are mostly plant-based and one of them is dandelion, which grows very deep roots down into the lower than the topsoil, right? It goes down into the rocky layer. And so most of the, um, rock is silica. And this is, uh, since the dandelion can get down and quote unquote, communicate better with the silica, we can then say that commute. Dandelion communicates well with silica. And so we put the dandelion medicine into the compost pile, which ends up on the field before plants are cropped. And Steiner says that a field or a crop that was tra- that was treated with the dandelion prep, much like the trees can communicate with each other, he says it can access the nutrients it would need from an adjacent meadow or forest. Yes. That's how well it can communicate. Wow. So... Um, that that's just a flavor for the different um homeopathic medicines that get applied to the farm and um that's all sort of what you would call pre-crop right we do all that before we plant a single thing a lot of times farmers start thinking about planting their crop 
But this, all this work, some of it takes several years actually of development mm -hmm. prior to thinking about mm -hmm. planting the crop. And then of course, the products that we make is the solution to an ancient problem. The problem we had all the way back to when you were talking about the ayahuascaros or the early people developing these relationships with plants. The food and the plants that we have today are so far away from their original form Corn's the classic example. Yes. Its origin is teosinte, mm -hmm. which is a grass. It looks like grass, and it's yes. got two tiny little kernels at the top. And then now we have the corn that we know. So there was some deep, deep spiritual work for hundreds of thousands of years. And then since the beginning of agriculture for tens of thousands of years, that created all of the domesticated foods and, and medicines that we're aware of mm -hmm. um so yeah I, I was just going down a, a rabbit hole there I don't, yeah I don't it's know cool. where I was going but uh you know it's, it's just interesting to to get the perspective and what what was rising into my mind while you were talking there is if there's anybody listening to this who's so left brain and scientific materialist that they're going oh this is bullshit then i have a very simple litmus test for you find a certified biodynamic farm that sells the kinds of foods you like to eat and that you eat regularly. So like if you like to eat beef or you like to eat uh, turnips or you like to eat uh, you smoke pot, then find a certified biodynamic source and eat whatever it is that you like to eat and watch what happens when you taste it, when you smell it, and you feel how it affects you on the inside and how it affects your mind, your emotions, your sex drive, and every other damn thing. And then if you uh, say, okay, how did that happen? <laughs> like we just told you. <laughs> exactly. You, you'd be amazed how many people come to the farm and say something like, oh, I don't like this or I don't like that. And then they taste it and they say, oh my gosh, yes, yes. I've never tasted Kids anything do. like that. Kids will eat uh, like, lots and lots of my students and people that have read my book all over the world have emailed me or told me in person before i studied your stuff and started buying organic and biodynamic food my kids hated vegetables but now they love them and i say yes because they're actually eating real food that has flavor in it and nutrients that makes their bodies want them okay well listen to where that story ends because one day you start noticing that and then one day you find yourself owning a biodynamic farm and then one day you have a daughter who's born on that farm who will go out into the field and will literally graze yes. berries and cherries mm -hmm. for hours. Just she, like my son. <laughs> she will eat berries until her chin and neck are stained. <laughs> nice. That's and, a lucky girl. <laughs> and then she will you will give her a berry or a cherry in any setting outside of the farm. She'd she'll like... take one bite and she'll put it down. Or she'll tell people that one actually was picked too early. <laughs> <laughs> she might be the next great Lady Eve Balfour. Or well, you know, it's like when you put a cow out to pasture, they know with their instincts which grasses are the most sure. nutritious to go mm -hmm. find it. Yeah. In the same way, our daughter has been raised with this food quality. Her yeah. instincts are finely tuned. She knows intuitively which foods are good for her. Have you ever seen the documentary titled The Other Side of the Fence? Mm, I don't think so. It's, it's a documentary and on the cover it shows cows reaching through the fence so hard to get the grass on the other side of the fence that they're almost ruining the fence. And the whole documentary is about what happens when cows are in commercially farmed fields that are next to organic fields and they will not eat the grass that they're on and they will ruin the fences and split their necks open trying to eat all the organic I've grass on that. the other side of the fence. I have seen that. Yeah. yeah. AcresUSA. Yeah. AcresUSA.com, the other side of the fence. And while you're there, get the documentary Hoxie, H-O-X-S-E-Y. And those two will teach you a lot. Great. So, I mean... Why, all this effort culminates ultimately for us in these products. In this case, yeah. the Summer Solstice Serum, which is the signature product that we're, yeah. we're launching in, uh, on a large scale. I wish you were selling all those other things you fed me over the years. <laughs> oh I my would, gosh. I would be uh, having my own shipping line. I'd, I'd probably go into business as your uh, sales manager. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, cu and main customer. But what you would, you know, what your listeners don't know is that we actually suffered serious wildfire damage right. this year. Right, that's terrible. And so that's we so lost sad. our whole tea collection, all of our biodynamic preps, our vinegars, our jams, uh, our entire 2021 product line, with the exception of the ingredients for this summer solstice serum, which we're, we probably won't get into it right now. But through a bizarre series of events, 
we evacuated the fire safely with these oils uh, and then blended them and bottled them in evacuation and are <laughs> have now sold them to the public. So they're very much sort of, for us anyways, in our small w- little world, mir- a miracle, a total yes, miracle. Yes, because God, what a terrible loss that would have been. That would have been thousands of dollars and countless hours of time. And Well, it's just all those years accumulating up into finally a, a, a finished product, you know? So yeah. it, 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 it meant a lot to me. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted you to share, Jared told me that he had huge gemstones near his house and the fire was so hot it melted the gemstones, didn't it? So we've been, um, in previous years, we've been working towards developing a hospitality experience on site where people would come visit and have an immersive experience in nature and on the farm. And as a part of planning for that, we had accumulated over the last decade, several sort of boulder size quartz crystals, rose quartz crystals, um, and a few sort of museum quality gemstones that were just really, you know, one of a kind because they all are. And uh, they were in our barn, which entirely burnt down, as did our cosmetic lab. But um, we don't call it a cosmetic lab. That was a weird title for it. But mm-hmm. we call them skin and body care treatments. Whatever but, um, it is. Yeah, so it all burnt down. And uh, it's a little bit of a setback, but uh, enough survived that we're, we're definitely moving forward. We're on our feet. We have these amazing products. And uh, we're looking forward to farming again this spring once we repair a variety of things that were damaged and by the grace of god your house did not burn down and almost everything around you for miles burned down didn't it a good amount of the region burned down it was a very large historic fire that we were in the center of um and it is true that the fire approached the farm and the house which are immediately adjacent to each other on all four sides uh-huh. and then disappeared into the ground and sort of just put itself out. That's, uh, let's call it the work of angels. Yeah. If, if, um, if people end up on our Instagram at be here farm, it's, you know, I don't post that frequently. So probably just 10, 20 posts ago, you can, you can see all the, uh, the photos from that time. And you could actually see black ash just, ending and stopping about a foot away from the house and the farm it's pretty miraculous that's crazy man so you were going to tell us some specifics about the the serum right well you know we just went down a whole um kind of understanding of how biodynamics thinks a little bit differently but i just wanted to tie it back together with what we actually do you know Mm -hmm. day to day with that and so the we talked earlier about the saint john's wort Mm -hmm. That's one of the uh, seven ingredients in the summer solstice serum. And another one, yellow dock, is also wild foraged. Wild foraged ingredients are very well demonstrated to have sometimes hundreds or thousands of times the nutrient density of domestic crops. And obviously biodynamic crops would be the most, you know, one of the most nutrient dense ways of producing domesticated crops. And so we're exclusively using biodynamically grown or wild crafted ingredients. Mm -hmm. The other flowers, just like St. John's wort, have millennia of folk traditions where people have been using them, um, I was about to say medicinally, but it's a very modern concept. And we, we were talking about um, sort of in the beginning when we first started. <laughs> What's with, the word? <laughs> right. And then after a while, when we started really developing a spiritual relationship and, and, and working with these plants, it was, first of all, because we were saving each other's lives, right? We didn't have doctors in hospitals. We were breaking our legs. We were yeah. falling ill. It getting, was a, like eating the things that would poison us. Life or death. And so through, getting bit by snakes. Through this intuitive perception, we developed the ability to learn what was lethal or life-giving. Intuitive or communicative with the plants and the animals that have that wisdom. I mean, shit, if you look in Native American lore, there's bear wisdom there's beaver wisdom they these people lived with these beings these animals like brothers and sisters right so they uh, i you know i grew up on vancouver island with the haida indians and my mother's they were most of my mother's customers because we sold our my mother's my mother and father had a woolen factory so we took our own sheep sheared them and my mother then is a spinner and a weaver and we would sell bulk wool so my mother was always interacting with the indians and we would hear about you know their cultures and i would read about how they you know related and like people don't really realize how 
you know, like a lot of people think, oh, you could never talk to an animal. That's stupid. And I, I would say to you out there, any of you that has a dog or a cat, do you understand when your dog or cat wants something? Do you understand when your dog or cat is uncomfortable, right? Well, the same way you can have a relationship with an animal, these people were living in nature with them. The cats didn't live outside or, you know, it's like, they, this is like, you know, you're sleeping with these creatures, right? And so the, I think that a lot of people today just can't conceive of how an Indian could come up with bear medicine or otter medicine or salmon medicine or whatever, but they, they, they didn't have anything else you know, there wasn't um, gummy bears and, and soda crackers and Chips Ahoy and, and uh, Mars bars. So, you know, it was like salmon and blueberries and everything was in season. And so they, they, they knew, right? Eating the food was like getting a message from the food. For example, if they ate something and it tasted off, they would immediately begin searching for why is this happening? Something's changing in the environment. So they're, they're constantly interfacing with the environment. And in this state of mind, there wouldn't have been the delineations that we have between food or medicine or skin care. It was all sacred gift. And yeah. it was a whole body multidimensional experience that mm -hmm. was healing. It was in our religious ceremonies. The olive oil in our product is the olive oil in the Hanukkah candles. Mm -hmm. The olive oil in our product, the chamomile in our product was, I was listening to Simon Chang's episode, was at Cleopatra's orgy as well, in addition, <laughs> in addition to hibiscus. <laughs> yeah. So these things were sacred beings that we were participating with. Yes. Our farm views it in the same way. So you might say, oh, we make skincare products. No, actually, we're just participating with nature. And so sometimes we'll make culinary products, sometimes mm -hmm. we'll make medicinal products, sometimes we'll make skincare products, sometimes we'll make body care products, sometimes mm -hmm. we'll make bath products. All of these different things to us are just sort of the fruition of this becoming. And ancients would have had the same problem. Once these things become, they unbecome very quickly. So how do you capture them? Yeah. How do you capture this moment immediately so yeah. that you can enjoy the benefits of it for as long as possible? And that's one of the ways we can use technology positively like flash freezing or shrink wrapping i mean we have ways to <clears throat> we're fortunate because we can capture the fruit or the vegetable or the animal in that special moment but then we back then we had to eat it or use it because we didn't have a lot of storage i mean if right. it was a herb you could dry it out but not much could be stored for very long but today we can actually take something from your farm that's been captured in the moment and preserve the moment with a freezer. We can. And, you know, in this case, we're doing it in the same way that they would have been able to do it originally as well, which mm -hmm. is that we're preserving it into olive oil. Yes. And, and so the way that we do it is we take wild St. John's wort, calendula, German chamomile, Roman chamomile, Tulsi, yellow duck, which is also wild, and go to cola. All seven of these botanicals, I mean, people probably are familiar with them, but yellow dock and go-to cola go way back in Chinese herbalism. The chamomiles go way back, calendula, way back. These things have ancient folk traditions of being essentially cure-alls for yeah. the skin. So I could, you know, you, you don't sell skincare products as a medical solution, and so I'm not claiming that our product does this, but these ingredients have been used for the following reasons over time, besides spiritual ones like, you know, eczema, rashes, burns, whether they're from, you know, heat or the sun, um, scratches, first aid, inflammation, redness, discoloration. Bites. Literally, I mean, that's what a cure-all is. So if you had a skin problem, these flowers are all traditional flowers that have been used uh, across cultures. And so we then preserve them in also a very traditional way by submerging them into olive oil. Um, you, you, just like we farm with sort of the different silos of pre-crop, you know, pre crop, crop, and post-crop, somebody who's making this product also has the opportunity to start at this p point right now. They could just buy ingredients from somewhere to make a right. skincare product. Yeah. When you buy ingredients from somewhere, I mean, as somebody who lives on a farm day to day, it's hard to imagine outsourcing the quality control um, uh, over many farms in many countries. Because in skincare, there's sort of the idea that 
certain ingredients developed in certain countries, like for example, Bulgaria and Hungary are famous for their chamomile. We also grow chamomile. The difference between a famous place in its native terroir, perhaps, I don't even know if it is from there, but that's where it has a culture of growing it. Um, they have to harvest it, dry it, package it, ship and freight it before that person gets it. So you can't outsource the quality control and you can't outsource the freshness. Both of those things are what create the potency, which creates the quality yes. and the efficacy. So in our case, we don't use artificial heat or pressure to create the to process the serum. That is the only way it is done, mm -hmm. unless you, you're sort of practicing a folk tradition, meaning that skincare products are made by heating them up or pressurizing them. And the best products take a few weeks, but most are made in a few hours. You mm -hmm. can imagine putting flowers into olive oil or some other oil and heating it up and getting the active ingredients in some way to come into the oil. And, you know, you could also buy your oil from somewhere and yet you see uh, Davis just put out a study that 82% of avocado oil is either rancid or fraudulent, meaning not even avocado oil. I wouldn't doubt it, especially in commercial foods. Some other oil. So it's really hard to outsource these things. And so we've spent years creating them ourselves from the soil up. Yeah. At which point, as opposed to using artificial heat or pressure, we place these glass jars of oil and flowers into what we call our serum throne, which is a glass hut in the center of the farm. And... We leave it there for one complete moon cycle so that it's exposed to uh, each phase of the moon equal forces exactly mm -hmm. balanced forces yeah. and the only force of action that is applied to these products is the pulsing rhythm of daytime and nighttime and in this pulse the flowers begin to unwind their active ingredients which bond into the fatty acids of the oil mm -hmm. at which point we cold press them blend them and bottle them on the farm so yeah. nothing's ever stepped foot off the farm. Yeah. Our olive oil comes from a, 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 a partner who's a biodynamic farm and produces it. We do have 50 olive trees, which is not, uh, they're, they're quite young. It's not enough to produce the oil that we need. So we've partnered with a legendary biodynamic farmer in Mendocino to derive this oil. Um, Beautiful. And then our flowers go into it. So it's rare, meaning 1% of farmland in the U.S. is organic. 0.002% is biodynamic. Wow. It's mathematically very rare. It's very potent yeah, due yeah. to the manner in which it's grown. Mm, I love it. Both of which lead to its, you know, I wouldn't have you on the podcast to talk about it if I didn't already go, this is something people need to know about. Now, yeah, a lot of people can't afford something like that. Um, but those of us that can generally want the best if we're going to spend the money on biodynamic food it's because we want the best if we're buying a tesla or an audi it's because we think that's the best car right most people that value themselves value what they put on and in themselves wouldn't you agree well if you can afford to put the best on and in yourself then this is not uh, an expensive product to me it's a, what I call a valuable product, right? So that's why I love it. I mean, there's really thousands of hours um, leading up to the production of, of this bottle. And we only produce it at the summer solstice as well because we can't even produce it in the winter because there's not enough direct sunlight to produce it in this method. So right. this is about as small batch and artisanal as you can imagine from farm to bottle. Well, anything that you want to share, Jared, about... Uh where people can reach you, uh, what was the offer you wanted to give everybody? So the product, the easiest way to find the product and to um, take advantage of the offer is on sunpotion.com and to just search for the Summer Solstice Serum. There's also a direct link to that page in our Instagram account, which is at Be Here Farm. Right. So that's if, the link in our profile. And if then they're going to get a cost, a, 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 a podcast discount. No, no. Yeah. Have that set up there. Do you? At, that's where the discount will oh, be. Okay. Yep. Okay. So our website um, and the rest of our product line will all be uh, coming along for this year and uh, over the course of this year. And Sun Potion is the only online retailer at the moment um, where people can go buy it. So the link in our Instagram profile takes you directly to the Sun Potion product page for the Summer Solstice Serum, where if um, people are interested in buying it, they should use the code, all caps, Dr. Happy, and that is going to give them a 10% discount. 
discount off right. the product. And Sun Potion was also kind enough for folks who do go buy the serum, uh, they can get 10% off Sun Potion's collection at that time as oh, well. Oh, wow. Yeah, which is an amazing 50 plus SKU collection. Oh, of that's great. Herbs and adaptogens. I'm sure Angie and Penny will be right on it. <laughs> Good. Uh, now, how about the personal website, Be Here website, anything else you want to share so people can find you? And maybe do you have a newsletter or anything people can email to find out about new product releases or anything? The best way to stay in touch with us is to keep up with us and just follow us on Instagram. Okay. Uh, because all of that sort of stuff will be advertised there. Okay. What was the Instagram uh, address again? It's at Be Here Farm. At Be Here Farm. The at symbol. Yeah, that's just typical for Instagram. So you don't really need that, but it's just Be Here Farm. Cool. Yeah. And then that's our website as well, beherefarm.com, which you're not going to find anything at right now. Um, but I look forward to seeing you there in the future. Yeah, cool. Well, Jared, I loved it, man. I got to review my biodynamic farming and I got to pick up a couple of neat things from you that I either hadn't read or had forgotten about and went, oh, yes, yes. Oh, yes. I forgot about that. Oh, that's Oh, that's fantastic. Oh, my God. Paul, I can't tell you how grateful I am for your invitation to come share this information with people. And thank there you. are a lot of people that I would like to thank um, for giving me the information that I shared today. I won't because there's too many of them, oh, okay. but I will thank you because you're, you're right at the top of the list. So thank you, buddy. Well, thank you so much. We spent five years working together and me and your brother have been at it for 10 years. So we've been uh, sharing the love for a while. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it very much. Yeah. All right, everybody. I hope you really enjoyed that. I found it fascinating. I, I love Steiner's teachings. I think they're very important in the world right now. And uh, you can find all sorts of neat information. There's, there's documentaries. I've seen a couple of documentaries on Amazon. I think if you search Rudolf Steiner, um, there's uh, quite a lot of books out there. If you're wanting to find a good variety of Rudolf Steiner's books, then just research the Waldorf school system. And if you find a Waldorf school system or search Steiner bookstore, but most Waldorf school systems, a lot of them have bookstores in them. And that's where I bought a lot of my books all over the world. But in some big cities, they have Waldorf, uh, I mean, Steiner's bookstores. Like in Sydney, they have a, a good one, for example. In London, England, they have a couple of them that I've got a lot of books from. Uh uh, there's actually a free resource as well. Oh, is there? Rudolf, um, if you just Google Rudolf Steiner Audio, I believe, there's hundreds of his books read by this incredible guy named Dale, who they call the voice of Steiner now. Okay, cool. And uh, you can interact with Dale if you email him too. He's brilliant. Neat. I used to be part of a Steiner library where I could um, check out um, the different lectures that are in the books on audio cassette. And so for years, I listened to Steiner's lectures on audio cassette that were read by a reader. That, that may have been this guy because he went from cassette to digital. And that was his story, too. He used to do that for himself. Uh -huh. And then he started sharing with other people. And then he got permissions from the publishing houses to do this. Oh, and cool. so now he's adding new ones. There's There might be a thousand or so lectures That's on That's fantastic. Something crazy. Yeah. What's it again? I think it's RudolfSteinerAudio.com. But yeah. if you just Google Rudolf Steiner Audio, you'll definitely get it. I want to share one more resource if, yeah. if you're okay. Um, it's called Landback, which was introduced to me uh, through a, a lecture I saw at the Bioneers Conference. Mm -hmm. uh, a Native American studies professor out of Humboldt, a woman named Kutcher Rizling Baldy, was the one speaking about it. So you could look up Kutcher Rizling Baldy if you're interested in learning Can more you about spell that. that. Well, uh, sure. Kutcher is C U T C H A, and then Rizling, R I S L I N G, and then Baldy, B A L D Y. But the program that I'm saying you might want to check out is called Land Back, which is the idea that the U.S. government owns uh, hundreds of millions of acres of land and should consider giving some of it back to native tribes because um, for many reasons. Yeah. But one. But they stole it from them for the first part. <laughs> right. So for many reasons. <laughs> and, and, and Let's just start with the basics. And the, the state of their, um, their health and yeah. their disproportionate imprisonment and, yeah. and jailings and stuff yes. like that. But. The, for a reason that everyone should be aware of just from the uh, sake of the planet and, uh, and logic, 5% of the world is U.S. is indigenous population. 5% of the uh, world's population is indigenous people. And they're stewarding currently 85% of the world's biodiversity. So wow. there's a, uh, a real argument to be made that they're doing an excellent job. And um, 
probably at a far lower cost than the federal government is managing these lands. Yes, so yes. There, there's a, you know, give the land back. That's the, the aim of that program. Let's just hope they don't get into bulldozers and too much alcohol and turn into white men Indian with the land like uh, can happen. Well, you know, if communities have localized food systems where they're feeding themselves nutrient dense food and they're engaged with the land and they're able to support themselves, um, I think that they should come out all right. Yeah, good. Yeah. It's just, you know, if you've ever been around Indian reservations and you see what happens when you put them on in white man's culture, uh, they lose the Indian and they turn into the average white man. Well, that's the atrocity of our culture. Yes, I know, but I'm saying if we give Indians a bunch of land and they carry too much white man back to it, they might destroy it like white people do. I'm saying we got to find natives that really care for the land to give it to them. Yeah, I agree. Um, uh, in general, you know, for all humans, we need people who understand the concept of unity. Yes. Um, but the <laughs> quickly <laughs> another woman who's speaking on this exact topic um, is Leah Peniman and Soul Fire Farm, and that's a regenerative agriculture farm as opposed to a Native American studies. This is a regenerative farm somewhere on the East Coast who's writing about the same topic and. Um, so, you know, maybe put her in charge because it seems like she's got the right idea. Yeah. And speaking of that, before we close out, I want to say we've talked about the best farming system in the world. But if you want to learn about the worst way to handle the planet on many levels, including farming, get a hold of Vandana Shiva's book, Oneness Versus the One Percent by Vandana Shiva. And she unbelievably well shows what Bill Gates and many of his related companies are up to and what they want to do with seeds and what they've done in countries like India and other places uh, to shut down farmers and stop them from uh, using their own seeds and just a long, long list of very, very dangerous things. And he is trying to implement that worldwide right now. And that book is a call to action. So you know, if you think our health is degraded a lot through industrial agriculture, wait till you see what Bill Gates is up to with his genetically modified organisms and taking away all the seeds so you can only buy seeds from him. And it's a fucking nightmare. It, it, it'll be called Smart Ag, and uh, I'll give you, <laughs> yeah, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a real life example. We just because of the fire, we had to buy a new tractor. It came a, a day after I got the tractor. I got an email that said. Would you like to sign up for software updates on your tractor? Yeah. And I said no. And then I mean the first one said, Would you like to sign up for data sharing? Right. Capabilities. And I said no. Yeah. And then the second question said, Would you like software updates? And I said yes. And it said, You can't say yes unless you share the data. And to which I said, Why the fuck does a tractor need software updates? Like because it's going to Bill Gates and company. Exactly. So that's the whole point. They're 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 looking to commoditize data and information as a replace for wisdom and knowledge, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. that's the future. And that's part of the problem. You see, just like doctors today largely never know their patients because they're just data sets. They look at labs, they look at numbers. They don't actually get to know the patient. They don't know anything about their life. They're just data sets. And so now what's happening is they're trying to turn farming into a data trading business and looking at everything algorithmically and next thing you know, AI will be farming and we're going to have more companies selling more chemicals and more tricks. I mean, here's how stupid this whole scientific materialistic paradigm can get. I was reading a, a biotech journal or something like that on an airplane somewhere. And I came across an article where it talked about the problem with the bees dying out. And some nanotechnology company had proposed to the United States government that for a certain number of billions of dollars, they could make mechanical bees. Oh, of bees course. Yeah, just make robot bees. That they would send out the, to do all the pollinating and like it was no big deal. We were losing the bees. And I'm like, if you actually think that you can make a robot bee that has even a fraction of the intelligence and functions that the bee offers in nature, you are so dangerously deluded and drunk and lost and confused. It's not even measurable. Yeah, that's smart egg. 
that's what Bill Gates is up to. That kind of shit. Yeah, I would love to <laughs> one day come back and talk about that. But what I would love even more is to hear Vandana Shiva come talk to you about that. I would. I've been trying. I've left her two messages, and I think she's probably just got people after her from everywhere because she's a pretty powerful woman. What an amazing maybe she, woman! May, maybe she'll remember me. I met her at an airport once the day I was about to propose to Velisa, and I went up to her and I said, I told her the news that I was about to propose to Velisa, and she sort of blessed me in the moment. And oh I, wow! I felt like uh, I felt like Saint Vandana. She, because yeah. at the time I was at a Slow Food International conference, uh-huh. and she was the keynote speaker, wow. of, so she was really sort of like a you know deity in that setting. She's an amazing woman, fantastic. And the book I agree was fascinating. I think the only other woman um, that uh, um, really that I think of off the top of my head when it comes to really smart smart women is Jean Houston. If you put Jean Houston and Vandana Shiva together in one body, you've got the divine feminine right in its fullness. Uh-huh. You ever studied any of Jean Houston at no, all? No, I'll have to look into her. Oh my God. See if you can find any interviews with her, no matter what it is, audio. There's a lot, there's a couple of them on Guy on Thinking Aloud with Jeffrey Mishlove. She's written like 25 books, but she's consulted to presidents and leaders all over the world. She's like, this woman is completely unreal how deep and smart and spiritual she is she's like unbelievably great cool i look forward to that and vandana shiva is just like she, you read her stuff and listen to her lectures and she is like someone who's lived two million lifetimes in one body yeah i've seen her speak in person a couple times and, yeah and, it, and she's powerful so yeah communicator well what a great journey man um so fun i had to put a podcast on to get jared to come visit me but it worked and so Thanks for all of you. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned lots. Hope you feel inspired to go start your own organic or biodynamic farm and do it right. Yeah, get involved. Yeah, help save the world. And uh, thank you for all the purchases you make from the sponsors of the podcast. They're all amazing people with very high values who are very conscious of the things that we've spoken about in here and hope they put their heart, soul, and energy into not only bringing you great products, but making sure the earth continues to be loved, nurtured, and and heals. And uh, everything you buy from them supports the podcast so that I can take the time it takes to uh, search for all the guests, research the topics, pay my podcast team to put together a great podcast for you. So I just want to say thank you very much. I'm doing my best to love you. And thank you for loving me back and the podcast team back. So Oh, uh-huh, great spirit. Can't wait to share more with you. I got some amazing interviews coming your way. Lots of love. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Jared Picard. You can visit the Be Here Farm Plus Nature's website at beherefarm.com or follow them on Instagram at beherefarm. If you'd like to try the fabulous Summer Serum, which is one of Paul's favorite skincare products, you can get 10% off by using the promo code Dr. Happy. That's capital D, capital R, capital H, capital A, capital P, capital P, capital Y at bit.ly forward slash Summer Serum. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Summer Serum. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. Watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and get your free subscription to Check videos and more at the Check Institute's new media site, chiquiva.com. Oh.